How is COVID there? Uh, Anand, I have a question. Yeah. If I may. Uh, will it be recorded? Huh? Will it be recorded? Will the meeting be recorded? Yeah, yeah it, is, it is recorded. Yeah. That's what. Ah, yes, I see. Yeah. And then you put it on YouTube. Uh, yeah. yeah.
నమస్కారం సార్ రామయ్య గారు బాగున్నావు సార్ మీరు బాగున్నారా నమస్తే రఘునాథ్ సార్ హలో హలో డాక్టర్ స్వైన్ ఫర్ యూ యా గుడ్ సార్ ఫర్ యూ యు ఆర్ ఇన్ స్వీడన్ సమ్వేర్ రైట్ నో ఐ రిటర్న్ టు ఇండియా ఐ వాస్ ఇన్ ఇజ్రాయెల్ ఓకే ఓకే వేర్ ఆర్ యు నా వర్కింగ్ మాకా సార్ వేర్ ఆర్ యు వర్కింగ్ uh just sir i joined a university join an university in odisha oh okay so the ice is coming somewhere hello sir hello 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 sir okay good afternoon to everybody there yes sir yeah uh shall we start sir please 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 yeah so this afternoon i welcome everyone uh, especially uh, our vice chancellor who to time to join uh, uh, in this meeting and uh, then the dean school of lecture <laughs> professor jayananda and uh, professor shivakumar and uh, professor uh, ilias stamber stambler uh, who is from israel he is uh, and also the other uh, invitees uh, like uh, dr professor mahendra nath thakur uh, and uh, the mario kriages and uh, the patur kondaya and uh, professor kv ramaya is always there in join and uh, the professor yes rojling and uh, the, uh, professor oh he will be joining uh, at on 7:30 uh, this what he told me so the it is a uh, uh, in a very short notice the speakers have agreed uh, the idea of uh, conducting this uh, symposium and uh, the and they already provided the required titles in the and we were able to organize this in memory of professor k subara so professor k subara is one of our uh, uh, the very senior faculty member and he was with us uh, for a long time and uh, 
um, I had a chance to work with him uh, for uh, almost 10 years. And uh, he's the person brought me into the area of aging. And also, the uh, major interest of me is uh, looking at uh, the non replicative functions of topoise grid to beta, and which he has uh, involved in the. Uh, actually, when he said invited to me to get involved in the ICMR project, which is a CREP, the a Center for Research and Education in Brain Aging. So in that, when he invited me, then I then I thought about let me look into the topoise and should be non replicative functions. So that's how I got into that, and later I continued that work, and we also collaborated in different projects. So we had a continuous interaction, and even we are involved in the trendies, and also the SNC also he only invited me to get involved. So that's how I got into this, and um, even. Uh, 2019, uh, uh, he attended a, uh, a personal marriage of uh, my daughter also. So last year I was out of country, so I didn't know how he is. And uh, this uh, I, uh, it's uh, happening to hear that he is more uh, aware. So that's uh, so with this uh, uh, my experience with him, and it's very nice. And uh, whenever uh, I approach him, he was very. Uh, in open hearted, he tried to explain, and we used to have a lot of interaction both in science and uh, so with this little uh, sharing about this case of memories. And uh, I invite all speakers and uh, all uh, the students who joined. Uh, so there are some more students who will be joining soon, so um, who joined and, uh, to this uh, um, symposium, which is. Uh, and uh, um, I request uh, the, our Vice Chancellor to um, address the, uh, the uh, audience. Thank you, Dr. Anand Kondapi. Am I audible? Am I visible? Yes, 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 yes sir. OK, yeah. So uh, I'm happy to be part of this uh, Society for Neurochemistry India Symposium 2021. And uh, we are. Uh, doing this uh, afternoon symposium in the memory of late Professor Kalluri Subaraoga, who recently departed from us. A very interesting and very stimulating luminary, not only in the area of biology, but also in the area of Vedanta. You remember to have had interesting discussion with him on several aspects within neurochemistry, neurobiology, and beyond. A very interesting open mind. And in memory of him, we are doing aging mechanisms and interventions this afternoon. I have some vivid memories of Professor Kalungaru. He was alumni of IASC Bangalore, same place that I come from. In fact, PhD also from the same lab that I so in some sense, in ISC, he also started looking at DNA repair. The problems come from compromise in DNA based accession repair process. A very important discovery, and we used to discuss a lot about this. We pin down the problem to the level of DNA polymerase beta and DNA ligase. An important finding. He was well brought up in many institutes. After doing PhD in IAC Bangalore, he even got DSC from IAC Bangalore. He spent time in St. Louis. USA, Temple University, Philadelphia, USA. He came back, joined NIN Hyderabad, and then became reader in Manaras in the university. From there, he came back to Hyderabad Central University as a professor. He did significant piece of work in neurochemistry in relation to DNA repair, which is what we are celebrating today. 
His accomplishments, accomplishments were well recognized. He was a fellow of Indian National Science Academy, National Academy of Sciences, Allahabad, as well as National Academy of Medical Sciences, India. He also was editorial board members in several journals, Gerontology, Neurochemical Research, Current Gerontology, Geriatrics Research, etc., etc. So one would see that his, his recognition spanned not only in basic research, but also into academies and into journals as editorial board member, as editor, he was recognized by several awards, UGC, Harivom Trust, Jesse Bose Award, to name a few. He was always a very interesting person to discuss with. He would easily go beyond what he's most comfortable with. He will enter into a terrain which is new to many things, many people, and he would do interesting discussion even beyond his own domains. Such people are very rare these days. And he was one of those rare people I had heard. I personally miss him. And this is one way I celebrate his accomplishments by addressing the community here in this seminar. It is my pleasure to be addressing the gathering in honor of Kaluri Subaru and my. Let's go to him and all the speakers, all the participants all the best. of the seminar, so that they learn through this seminar, then pay tribute to Professor Alvaris this symposium that we are doing in honor of his memories. I would say I would more. Wish the conference all the very best. And I would think this conference will enrich the participants, all the speakers of this meeting. And we are specially privileged that we are hosting this symposium at your city, Hyderabad. My special word of welcome to my non Indian friends who are joining across large distances. I want to thank you, them, for being part of this interesting celebration. Thank you very much. Namaste. Thank you very much, sir, your kind words and also sharing your experiences with uh, Subarao. And uh, uh, also there is a uh, lot of uh, commonality uh, that uh, about the his area working and also his interest with you. So thank you so much. And uh, then we will I request uh, Professor Dayananda Garu to um, give a few words. Good afternoon. I hope I am audible to all of you. Hope you are seeing me all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I am really delighted to be associating with this fascinating seminar organized in honor of Professor Kallur Subbarav Garu, whom we all revere as father figure of the School of Life Sciences. Seniors like Professor Subbarav put their best efforts in bringing brick by brick and building this School of Life Sciences. We are boasting of too many things about School of Life Sciences today, but I always say these words and I don't hesitate to tell openly and what all we are enjoying, we are enjoying the fruits of hard work of our predecessors. Professor Subbarao, who was very close to my guru, Professor C.P.S. Sastri, both were classmates, started working in the same lab, of course, on different topics. and. At the fag end of their journey, they also joined, reunited at University of Hyderabad. These senior people brought young minds, young brilliant minds like Professor 
சிவகுமார் ப்ரொஃபஸர் கேவிஆர் ரமையா ப்ரொஃபஸர் அனந்தகுமார் ப்ரொஃபஸர் பிரகாஷ் பாபு அண்ட் ப்ரொஃபஸர் அனிதா ஜகோட்டா அண்ட் மேட் தெம் டு ஒர்க் ஆன் என் இன்ட்ரெஸ்டிங் டாபிக் லைக் ஏஜிங் அண்ட் பிரிங்கிங் ஹூஜ் கிராண்ட் ஃப்ரம் ஐசிஎம் ஸோ தட் ஆக்சுவலி இனிஷியேட்டட் அ நியூ ரிசர்ச் ஏரியா in already multidisciplinary school of life sciences every human being try to immortalize himself or herself by their deeds good scientists good teachers they need not have to do anything their teachings and their deeds inspire hundreds of their students and once they start inspiring it is like a wildfire it keeps going from generations to generations so that way professor subarav is highly successful in building a school of life sciences and also in creating an area of research which is really eternal and going strong day by day at school of life sciences with this few words i really thank my colleagues and good friends professor anand kumar professor shiv kumar professor kv ramaya and professor prakash babu for inviting me and giving me this opportunity thank you one and all thank you sir for your kind words and uh, also for enlightening and how this uh, other faculty member brought into the era of aging ூர் and uh, professor kallur subaraw garu was the dean of the school at that point in time and uh, when i came into the interview i still remember the days that there were stalwarts like professor ram sharma garu as an external member professor uh, lk ram chandran garu from usman university lot of uh, extensively uh, knowledgeable biochemists were there i was glad that i was selected in that committee as a lecturer and i decided to join this place and initially i was associated with subaraw garu in his laboratory and i was uh, helping some of his students also when i was uh, when i got a dad fellowship and i moved to germany and by the time i came back we moved to the new building so professor subaraw garu was instrumental in also setting up a new building in the old life sciences as we call it now and we during 1990s and 94 90s we moved to the new uh, life sciences building which is currently called as old life sciences for us and he was also instrumental in bringing lot of talented people as faculty members in the biochemistry department he was always uh, having come from the core uh, science institute iisc bangalore where he did his phd in the biochemistry area he was always fascinated towards biochemistry subject and as a good teacher and he is such an accomplished scientist in the area of neurosciences he has trained several students in the area of neurosciences and fortunately i know at least two of his phd students very closely one of them was my senior during studies one of them was my junior in uh, during uh, my studies so i closely used to watch uh, the progress of the students also and they all had very good uh, things to talk about and the training they are undergoing in the area of neurosciences and that point in time life sciences was uh, this was the only lab which was doing very good with neurosciences research and all his students have been extensively trained and they are all well placed across the globe he also was very much instrumental in identifying and determining that this subject of biochemistry should be part of the school and should also be an independent unit and he was instrumental in setting up the notion and idea of creation of departments in the school of life sciences and today we know we are about 16 member in the school of life sciences we work as a unitary school 
with departments and departments are primarily for the discipline purpose but we all integrate and work together as under the single umbrella of school of life sciences and most of the colleagues uh, in biochemistry department he was instrumental in recruiting myself professor ramanatham professor oh shetty professor k v ramaya professor anand kumar and so on and uh, it has proven that uh, the department has grown from strength to strength year after year and now the biochemistry department in terms of teaching and research is one of the most well sought department by students and many of our students are doing extremely well once they have qualified from the degree and gone abroad for higher studies he was also very much instrumental in conducting seminars and organizing seminars so scientific seminars on the campus and he was always trying to bring in people who are very well accomplished in their own research areas to so that the students will get the good exposure of different subject areas in general for the biochemistry one such stalwart was professor t ramesh magaru who was uh, also served as the chairman of the biochemistry department at iisc bangalore so he started a forum called as trendies in biochemistry in iisc bangalore for which uh, it was a uh, scientific forum which used to discuss over a cup of coffee different aspects of hypothesis new hypothesis arising and so on so there professor subbaragar was a regular participant and he told ram sharma garu whether he if he could nationalize this as a symposium which can be organized every year and ram sharma garu readily agreed and go ahead and then from then on professor subbaragar was taking charge of the as a convener for the trendies in biochemistry and i still remember that couple of years back as he was growing old he said uh, he called me and anand kumar and said uh, in front of ram sharma garu that now we are growing old i want younger generation people to take over this and they transferred the trendies account in the state bank of india into myself and anand kumar's names and labeled them as labeled both of us as the conveners for the trendies two years back we had the 25 years celebrations of trendies in biochemistry where we were fortunate to have ram sharma gar also physically present at the school of sciences building unfortunately we lost him uh, last year Uh, these are just the remembrances I have uh, with Professor Subbaragar. We discussed, we used to discuss so many things, so many meetings we attended together, and uh, he was also instrumental in uh, training myself in both in administrative positions and in the academic matters in relation to the biochemistry department. I always remember him, uh, and uh, because uh, he was the dean at that point in time when I was selected as a faculty member, and from then on I was stuck to University of Hyderabad. Finished thirty-five years. Still, I remember Professor Subbaragar as a very good teacher and researcher. I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Magadhar Kumar, for giving this uh, how this uh, genesis of trendies happened, and uh, you you know long time than we, uh, Professor Subbaragar. So you shared all your experiences. Now I request uh, Dr. Raghunath uh, to give a few words. yeah uh, good afternoon all all of you uh, i at the outset i would like to thank dr anand for giving me this opportunity to share my not so much but a little bit of experiences i had pleasant experiences with professor subbaraw garu i know professor subbaraw garu and uh, professor yen radhakrishnan who was my phd examiner way back in 1979 80 at the university of hyderabad and after my phd i worked with one of the students of uh, professor yen rakshan dr manju sridas at the university of pennsylvania at philadelphia and then there i had roommate mr visavjal prabhakar dr visavjal prabhakar who was student of kalur subbara so he was uh, he was working in the vistar institute and i was in the university of pennsylvania we were together as roommates for about a year and we continue our friendship even now uh, after coming back uh, i am from nia national institute of nutrition which i joined late 1975 by then professor subbaragar had joined and left in 1973 but i had the good fortune of interacting and continue to interact with dr late dr gmk janardhan sharma garu who was with professor subbaragar who worked together on the developing brain on uh, some aspects of uh, developmental research dna mechanism repairs etc in the human fetal brains and all that uh, subsequently my interactions with professor subbaragar uh, were 
uh, through official interactions and in meeting him and i attended several meetings in the university of hyderabad especially as member of the joining uh, selection committees and all that and also uh, i was i had the good fortune of interacting with both subhrav garu and prati ram sharma garu the founders of trendies uh, in fact i am very lucky to say uh, that i was very lucky to ho- uh, that professor ram sharma garu stayed in our lab for about a year when he was out of uh, cdfd and he spent time in our lab and afterwards again he left and went back to cdfd and from then on to ic bangalore and f- as far as professor subhrav garu concerned his group worked in my lab in the, in the national institute of nutrition hyderabad for almost 3 years that was on the effect of amylic rasayana and uh, on the dna repair mechanisms basic skin repair mechanisms and all that one of his students working at nin got his phd uh, on that subject and it's also it's not only that professor subhrav also encouraged me to enter into the field of aging so uh, we we got a project on aging from icmr uh, when he was Uh, the committee member or chairman of that committee and then in that project we worked on the vistar in an obese rat model which many of you must be knowing and we showed that it is not only obese but it ages very fast whereas normal vistar in an rat lives for about 36 months or so whereas this vistar in an ob lives for about 11 to 12 months so it ages faster so what are the mechanisms underlying the aging so this was all Uh, deciphered during the process of the icmr project in which we showed that increased oxidative stress and decreased antioxidant mechanisms could be one of the reasons for the increased uh, uh, aging seen in these animals and which you also confirmed by high sucrose high fat diet feeding also we showed that the aging is faster and there also oxidative stress all that is increasing and antioxidant stress decreases so uh, these are the two main uh, associations with me uh, with professor subhrav garu in addition of course i used to interact with him in many meetings and also i had the good fortune to host one of the meetings of trendies in nin uh, when both professor subhrav garu and professor ram sharma garu attended that meeting and i very well remember the talks given by professor ram sharma and uh, it was very interesting a novel concept he spoke on one protein uh, one gene one protein many functions or something something like that or one gene many proteins and many functions some concept like that and in which uh, in that meeting professor hasnain gave the oration trendy oration that year and uh, i had the good fortune of hosting that when dr sashikaran was director of nin and subsequently i gave a talk in one of the trendy meeting held in iic bangalore uh, now this was uh, all due to my interactions with uh, professor subhrav garu and the encouragement he always gave me uh, wholeheartedly in water whenever i approached him he has supported me and i very much thankful to him i miss him very much both professor subhrav garu and professor ram sharma garu i revere them as my gurus although i never had the opportunity to work with them directly uh, but i always considered them as my gurus and i'm very much happy that i have been given the opportunity to share my feelings about professor subhrav garu and whom i miss very much and once again i convey my sincere regards and Uh, respects to Professor Subhrav Garu and also late Professor Ram Sharma Garu, and thank Anand for again giving me this opportunity to share my experiences with this uh, genuine and uh, well-recognized scientist. Thank you, Anand. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dr. Uh, uh, Raghunath, for sharing your experience, and he spent uh, after retirement. If you are working on this Rasayana and already you are so keen, keen interested in understanding that uh, Rasayana and its role in aging, uh, especially on rats. So thanks a lot and uh, um, thank you. And uh, uh, the Professor Prakash Babu is actually held up in uh, ongoing meeting. Uh, it's uh, the there's another meeting going on. So there's a delay in sessions happened. So he will join us after some time. As and when he join, we will request him to give his remarks. So, with this, uh, uh, I thank uh, Vice Chancellor and uh, the Dean School of Life Sciences, Prasannanda, and uh, the uh, uh, Professor Sivakumar, Professor uh, uh, Dr. Raghunath, and uh, for sharing your experiences and uh, views on uh, uh, Professor Kesubarak. So, 
let us start scientific session. So, the, uh, so I request uh, Vidya to introduce uh, the chairs. Thank you, sir. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I introduce Professor Ilya Stambler, PhD. Uh, Dr. Ilya Stambler is a Chief Scientist Officer and the Chairman of Retic Association. The moment, like mo the moment for longevity and quality of life, Israel. The re he received his PhD at the Department of Science, Technology, and Society, Bar Ilan University. Is Israel. His research has focused on the historical and social implication of aging and life extension research. He is also involved in mathematical modeling of aging and aging related diseases. He is, author, he is the author of the books um, A Sto History of Life Extensionism in the 20th Century and Longevity Promotion Multidisciplinary Perspectives. He is actively involved in advocacy of aging and longevity research, serving as the chairperson, chairman of the Israeli Longevity Alliance, executive committee member of the International Society of, on Aging and Disease, and International Longevity Alliance, fellow and policy director at the Global Health Span Policy Institute. He has published over 60 academic papers Gen which includes general uh, general uh, articles and book chapters, including in progress in neurobiology, aging and disease, cancer detection and prevention, regeneration research, current aging science, global aging mechanism of aging and development, frontiers in genetics, zero science, encyclopedia of gerontology and population aging. Encyclopedia of Biomedical Gerontology and other scientific journals and books. So the, uh, the title on which he is going to give us a speech is International Promotion of Health, Healthy Long Longevity. Uh, I ask Professor uh, Ilya Sandler to start. Thank you, sir. I think you are in mute, I think. Huh? Is it right? You are not able to listen to you. Yes, sir. yes th thank you for this. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, and let me try to share my presentation. Uh, do you see my presentation? Okay. Uh, Anand? Yeah, 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 it's coming. Yeah, put it in the slideshow mode. Okay, great. So once again, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. I'm really honored to participate in this meeting in honor of Professor Kaluri Subarao. My please, topic please will keep, be... Please keep in the slideshow mode. Uh, okay. Um, how do I do this? Uh, what, one second, sorry. <clears throat> do you see my next slide with Professor Rao? No, not yet. Slide didn't change. Okay. Okay, let me um once again I try to share. Um okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh and now do you see the picture of Professor Rao? Yeah. Yeah, 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 we can see. Okay, great. So um, it is a real honor for me because I knew Professor Rao. I had the honor to collaborate with him. Uh, I have known him not only as a great scientist, but also a great uh, science educator, a promoter of science, an advocate for science, especially the science of aging. Um, a few years ago, I think around 2010, he wrote a paper uh, a popular paper, Should India Promote Scientific Research of Aging? And there he argued uh, that yes, absolutely, India must in its own interest promote research of aging and associated diseases. There are always some uh, discordant uh, voices projecting the distorted Indian wisdom. India's march toward becoming a global leader should not be allowed to be disturbed by um, uh, vested arguments. So basically, he argued that aging research is very important for India, despite some undercurrents that oppose this, that do not wish to 
invest in this field of science. Uh, and in this capacity as a science educator, I had the honor to cooperate with him uh, first at the University of Hyderabad at the Global Conference of the International Federation on Aging uh, back in 2014, where we co-organized a symposium on uh, aging research. And later we um, submitted the grant proposals together on promotion of aging research internationally. Uh, also wrote petitions uh, in support of aging research that were co-signed by some of the leading uh, aging researchers of India, including Professor Anand. Uh, so um, uh, my focus today is uh, the promotion of science, advocacy for science, scientific education. And why is it important to, uh, to promote aging research? Why is aging research important? Uh, we understand that aging is the main risk factor or even the main underlying cause for all age-related diseases, which are basically all the chronic diseases, including heart disease, uh, type 2 diabetes, and neurodegenerative disease. They all have the main risk factor, which is the aging process. So if we really wish to intervene and prevent age-related diseases, we have to somehow learn to intervene into aging process. And that was also the, the main focus of uh, Professor Rao. Um, and of course, uh, this, uh, the importance of aging research becomes clear in the recent period, in the period of COVID-19. We know that uh, COVID-19 mostly affects older persons uh, incomparably. If uh, in younger age, the, uh, the death rate is uh, virtually uh, zero to minimal. In old age, over 70, uh, the death rate uh, reaches uh, up to 20, 25%. So I understand that uh, uh, this virus uh, doesn't just affect all people, it mostly affects all the people affected by multimorbidity, affected by, affected by multiple age-related diseases. So if we really wish to uh, fight uh, this pandemic as well, we need to learn to improve the aging health, to improve the health of all the people, to prevent old age multimorbidity. Uh, I personally spent most of the last year advocating for this point for the connection between aging and uh, and uh, the COVID crisis, for the need to intervene into aging, improve aging health to combat uh, the pandemic. Uh, we organized international conferences. Uh, we published position papers uh, uh, together with some of the uh, leading um, aging researchers like Nir Barzilai, Philippe Sierra and others um, entitled Geoscience in the Age of COVID-19. Um, also, we, we uh, advocated for the for the improvement of aging immune system together with professor Moskalov, professor Calogero caruso all with the purpose to uh, to uh, draw attention to draw support for aging research also as a way as an important strategic way to combat not only the COVID pandemic but also perhaps all future crises that will affect the elderly uh, it is absolutely feasible to intervene into aging process, as Kaluri, uh, Professor Rao also advocated. Uh, there are multiple proofs of principle. Uh, there are several classifications of the basic aging processes uh, that can be influenced, that can be targeted. I will not go into too much details, but there is the uh, the pillars. There is the classification of the pillars of aging. Um, uh, there is a classification of the hallmarks of aging. Uh, there's the uh, classifications of the um, uh, strategies for engineering senescence. All these have the main point that uh, there are several basic aging processes uh, that underlie age-related disease and they can be intervened into. And there are proofs of feasibility, mostly in animal models, but uh, they're also beginning to emerge as human studies. It is our goal as uh, advocates for aging research to bring this research um, as fast as possible from basic animal studies to, to uh, human trials and then to the clinic. There are already emerging multiple so-called geroprotective uh, therapies or anti-aging therapies or um, health span improving therapies as you wish to call them. Uh, they can be classified as, uh, as detoxification means, uh, subtraction means. They can be classified as uh, additions, as supplements. They can also be classified according to the um, processes of aging that they target, for example, in the pillars of aging, we have the NIH Geroscience Interest Group classification of several aging processes that can be targeted uh, with various geroprotective means. 
Uh, Professor Rao also uh, dealt with uh, some of such um, geroprotective therapies, especially based on uh, on traditional Indian medicine, on Ayurvedic uh, uh, treatments, in, in particular to improve uh, the uh, the health of of, uh, of the aging nervous system of the brain. Uh, so there are definitely proofs of feasibility, uh, but uh, still uh, most of these studies are at the basic laboratory level, and we need to bring them closer and eventually bring them to the clinic. And of course, uh, we cannot treat something uh, or intervene into something that we cannot diagnose, that we don't have a, a good uh, clinical evaluation criteria for, and uh, such as aging. Yes, we can say we intervene aging, but what exactly do we measure? There are now several um, uh, approaches to measuring the aging process uh, by uh, functional assessments, uh, by biological uh, structural assessments uh, with bio various biomarkers of aging. Uh, of course, there is still no consensus exactly what it is that we need to measure to evaluate aging and to evaluate the effectiveness of anti-aging treatments. Uh, this is also a part of uh, the general discourse that we need to promote and also Professor Rao promoted in his time. <clears throat> Um, we do our part. Uh, in our research, uh, we also study some of the interventions into the aging process. Uh, for example, last year, uh, in collaboration with colleagues, we focused on the uh, intervention with mesenchymal stem cells, also in an attempt to improve the outcomes in COVID-19. Uh, and uh, how is this connected to aging? Very simply, uh, one of the main uh, hallmarks of aging is uh, chronic inflammation. Uh, the so-called inflammaging. So if we're able to mitigate uh, uh, inflammation, we'll also be able uh, to uh, intervene into COVID-19. And there were a couple of articles uh, published that show, did show positive effects. Unfortunately, um, uh, large-scale trials uh, uh, were not accomplished uh, for, for various reasons that I will not go into, but at least uh, there is this direction of uh, affecting the aging process um, and uh, affecting the the uh, chronic inflammation in this way also hopefully uh, mitigating COVID-19. And also in our other uh, work last year, we also reviewed the, uh, the various adaptive and um, innate immunity mechanisms and uh, uh, various immunoprotective, geroprotective means that, that can be that can be employed. So that's that's on the intervention side and on the diagnostic side we also try to contribute our part. Uh, for example, our quantified longevity guide project uh, seeks to um, seeks to develop uh, evaluation criteria for aging and age-related multimorbidity uh, using uh, some of the measures from information theory like uh, normalized mutual information together with my colleagues uh, Dr. David Bloch here in Israel uh, um, recently, we completed a special research topic on uh, clinical evaluation criteria for aging and age-related multimorbidity. We also try to um, uh, stimulate this discussion. What is it exactly that we need to measure uh, to, uh, uh, to assess aging health, but also to assess the effectiveness of anti-aging or geroprotective treatments? Um, and uh, that's just uh, our small part. That's uh, just a, a tip, a tip in the ocean. Um, uh, there are much more uh, extensive and successful studies, but at least we want to contribute uh, also uh, towards the purpose of, of um, education and uh, stimulating discussion of these topics. And of course, the, the very subject of education is extremely important for aging research promotion, not just at the academic level. Uh, but also at the um, at the public level, at the general public level, um, uh, we still need to uh, to advocate, still need to educate people about even the basic uh, uh, health span improving means like uh, rest and exercise and uh, moderate and balanced nutrition, life affirming attitude. Uh, but of course, all these interventions that have been known for, for hundreds of years, they do not contradict uh, the advancement of science. They go hand in hand. Uh, each reinforcing each other. So we advocate both for the uh, for the lifestyle improvements and for a greater investment in aging science. Uh, and of course, the investment of uh, for aging science will pay off. 
Uh, it should be obvious for everyone, uh, but uh, unfortunately, it's not always obvious to decision makers who still refuse to um, uh, significantly invest in aging research. Uh, but in terms of society, obviously, if, uh, if if we extend the healthy lifespan, even if by one, one year, we'll save um, hundreds of billions of dollars for a large country like India and the United States. It will be hundreds of billions of dollars savings uh, from um, uh, lessening burden on uh, healthcare system on the pension system uh, still uh, the decision makers do not um, do not um, adopt this argument uh, at least uh, when you try to explain to them they, they seem to understand but uh, then um, no action is taken and that was also what professor rao um, was um, kind of uh, fighting against uh, this this uh, general um, inability of decision maker of society to understand the importance of aging research for improving the health of the nation. Uh, but uh, we continue, we continue to do this advocacy work and uh, we need to educate basically everybody. We, we need to advocate this to everybody, to the general public uh, who will benefit from this research, to the pharmaceutical medical technology industry that will need to, um, uh, to understand the importance of uh, developing and uh, uh, marketing preventive treatments, not only late stage chronic treatments but also preventive treatments to, to improve uh, age related health uh, health insurer life insurance uh, systems that are also supposed to benefit uh, from um, uh, extending healthy lifespan uh, regulators and policy makers uh, uh, who will need to prioritize and increase the um, investment in aging research to improve the health of the public uh, scientists and students who will um, who will learn that uh, aging research is a very exciting area, uh, not only because of its social significance, but also as a scientific problem that basically involves all the problems of life. So uh, aging research ed education still needs to be uh, made more broad and disseminated more broadly. <clears throat> uh, and it, it can be disseminated not only in academia. Uh, I represent several um, uh, social professional societies such as uh, uh, such as the society the international society on aging and disease uh, international longevity alliance uh, global health and policy institute uh, our israel association the movement for longevity and quality of life and uh, our goal is to educate the public uh, not only uh, uh, the academic community but also the public about the importance of aging research to be, get them involved in, in study groups, in conferences, in um, uh, in popular publications. Uh, so all this is a part of a promotion of aging research. And of course, uh, there is advocacy, uh, advocacy per se, educating the decision makers, educating the, uh, the authorities about the importance of aging research. I do research, I have uh, scientific articles and books, but I'm also an activist um uh, within uh, the uh, the societies that i represent and we basically go to decision makers and uh, advise them at least try to advise them at the, about the importance of aging research several initiatives uh, that i had the honor to be involved is uh, writing a position paper on the critical need to promote research of aging every year we organize um, in october the so-called um, international longevity months to raise uh, the awareness the public awareness about the importance of aging research. Um, I had the honor to sign um, the uh, longevity dividend petition back in 2006 uh, together with Professor Olshansky. Um, in uh, 2019, uh, before the, the COVID, before the restrictions, we organized a conference in Israel um, on uh, international perspective on geroscience um, together with the NIH, with the Nathan Shock Centers. So we do our best uh, to, to raise uh, the awareness about aging research as wide as possible. And also with Professor Rao, as I mentioned um, a few years ago, uh, we distributed an open letter arguing for the support of aging and longevity research in India that was co-signed by several prominent aging researchers, uh, Dr. Anand Kondapi, Kolel, um, uh, Dr. Gandadaran and others, uh, addressed this letter to some of the officials in India. Uh, so uh, hopefully it will uh, make an additional contribution uh, to, um, to the development of this field in India. And of course, Professor Rao was, uh, was the leader of this effort. Um, uh, does this effort bring fruit? Um, uh, 
it is too early to say there is still a little um, uh, too too early and um, still uh, too little of this effort uh, of this advocacy effort but uh, already there are some um, uh, results that we can report uh, back in 2017 um, there was a joint uh, petition to who to um, to include aging into the uh, who work program it was there can you imagine uh, the who didn't consider consider aging to be um, uh, worthy of including into its work program and hundreds of uh, scientists hundreds of uh, organizations wrote to the who and demanded that this uh, issue is included and eventually it uh, it uh, it did uh, did work um, and it was included uh, as you can see here the uh, head of the uh, who aging uh, uh, aging division says the who listen this topic is included uh, with some specific uh, metrics for improving aging health so this is a win this is a victory for the aging advocacy movement uh, another um, uh, victory in another organization that i had the honor to be involved was uh, inclusion of uh, of aging as a modifying factor into the ICD-11, into the International Classification of Diseases. Um, and why is this important? Uh, simply because uh, you cannot uh, address something that is not recognized as a problem. Uh, professor actually uh, was against uh, calling aging a disease, uh, but uh, he did uh, uh, advocate that aging should be recognized at least as some kind of uh, uh, medical problem to be addressed. Uh, so, um, uh, hopefully, thanks to this um, uh, classification, this code of aging related, we will be able to directly address um, uh, aging, aging pathology, um, aging related, uh, aging related illness. And here in Israel, uh, we also advocate, we also uh, uh, promote aging research as much as we can. Talk with decision makers, organize uh, some uh, some meetings in, in Knesset in the Israeli Parliament. Um, we actually succeeded to include uh, the topic of uh, research, development, and education for health, longevity, and prevention of age-related diseases into the Israel Master Plan on Aging. Um, also, thanks to our advocacy, there were issued some calls for research proposals on aging uh, within Israel, uh, nationally, such as by the Ministry of Science, but also internationally. Uh, one of the proudest moments is the uh, establishment of the joint uh, British-Israeli aging research program uh, called Birex Aging, Britain Israel Research and Academic Exchange on Aging uh, uh, that was uh, sponsored by the British Council and the Israeli Ministry of, of Science. And um, uh, I had the honor to write the first draft of this call for research proposals uh, with the focus on geroscience, on prevention of aging related diseases. And uh, basically 200 labs uh, submitted, uh, 100 labs from uh, Israel, 100 labs from, uh, from uh, the UK. Uh, only 14 labs uh, uh, received the funding. And why is it important in this meeting? Because uh, the same way as we organized uh, this uh, collaboration between uh, Israel and the uh, UK, uh, it can be organized between Israel and India, between India and any other country. Uh, because uh, uh, thanks to international collaboration, even the quality of research, uh, even the impact of research will be increased. Thanks to cross-fertilization, to, uh, to, uh, to, to the exchange of ideas. So hopefully uh, more international research will be, uh, will be enabled. Also thanks to more funds for, for such international research. And uh, hopefully... Uh, uh, thanks to, to all those efforts, thanks to all these um, uh, advocacy, educational efforts, there will be more investment in aging science uh, that will allow um, aging researchers to do more work. Uh, and of course, uh, this um, uh, this field is, is, is boundless. This field is absolutely unlimited. Um, any collaborative project can be or, or program can be um, uh, scaled up to any dimensions, starting from a lab to lab collaboration to, to huge international uh, multi-center initiatives. Uh, these are some of the uh, these are some of the um, uh, frameworks, some of the institutions where, um, at least as I know of, um, uh, were raised. Uh, some of them um, uh, were more successful, some less. Some went farther, some went um, uh, not so far in terms of uh, continuation. But at least it shows the, the tremendous potential of aging research 
uh, not only by its own rights to to bring um, uh, benefits for the um, for the aging society, but also in terms of um, improving science, improving uh, international scientific collaboration. And uh, I think I will end with that. And I thank you once again for this opportunity to present. And uh, we'll be happy to to answer any question if there is any. Thank you, Professor Stambler, for uh, giving this excellent uh, overview of aging and advocacy that uh, the efforts that are put by Professor Rao and you over the years, and also your success in getting some of the recognition of some of these topics in the WHO and other agencies. So uh, I request any questions, one or two questions, if you have, we can be addressed. Are there any questions? Sir, I have a small question. Yeah. Professor Ramaya. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, please. This is about uh, between the two intervening into the aging mechanisms, the science related aspects, and actually reaching the aged population to keep them healthy and happy the societal role between the two for a country like india which one you suggest the trust should be on. yes yes this is a very multi multi-pronged task this involves many facets yes there is basic aging research there is also translational research there is also clinical research, and uh, somehow we need to accelerate all the branches. At the same time, is improve education. Education, aging, uh, uh, aging research is still not a uh, topic, uh, not a, a part of the curriculum uh, almost in any university, maybe at least in, in, in Hyderabad or in some other universities in India. But if you look at almost any university in the world, aging research is not a part of the curriculum. So we definitely we need to advance all aspects, all aspects, uh, both basic research uh, as well as translational aspects, uh, clinical aspects. So uh, it is a very massive task. No, my main question is societal role, really speaking on the education part and keeping the aged population really healthy and happy. You know, longevity, of course, uh, doesn't mean anything if the health is not good, but if you wanted the people to have a dignified aging and you know a good happy life what kind of uh, society should we have uh, i mean taking care of the aged population is it not a very important thing overall absolutely absolutely this is what advocacy is about we want to uh, to get the general society on board we want uh, them uh, understand the benefits of healthy aging and uh, as a result, we want them to support aging research. So it is really an interconnected, um, an interconnected effort. On the one hand, we want to benefit society through research. On the other hand, we need society to to support investments in research. In research, we want to to realize the importance of this problem. Uh, so uh, basically, one one um, influences the other. If a society is really ageist, if it seems that uh, you know the aging person is a burden that uh, we need to get rid of the aged people, of course, such a society will not uh, support aging research, will not support uh, extension of health and longevity. But of course, if, if society supports its elderly population, uh, if, if they, they think about uh, the, 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 uh, the future of society for the long term, uh, even if their own future, you know, uh, if we are lucky, we'll all be old and uh, we need to uh, to think about that as well. But such a society will, uh, will support um, aging research as well. So these are interrelated topics. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stambler. Now, Professor Prakash Babu, can you give some remarks? I think last time we missed Professor Prakash Babu. Yeah. Yeah, will you please give a few uh, remarks about uh, Professor Rao? Right. So uh, very good morning and good afternoon to, to all of you. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, uh, to share a few words of uh, experience uh, of with uh, Professor uh, Sivarao. <clears throat> I have been associated with him uh, maybe quite a long. As a student, uh, uh, he taught us uh, some neuroscience uh, lectures. Uh, he's very uh, uh, 
very, very, uh, very strict teacher, actually, in fact. So the way he teaches and the way he disciplines, uh, it's a highly impressive. And it's a pave way for the people to learn something out of this. Further, the other another interesting thing uh, with him is the uh, he will not be very serious. He will always be jovial. Uh, at the same time, but uh, he, he will tell uh, straight for straight uh, whatever he wanted to tell convey. So these are the very good qualities of him. So uh, another thing is that uh, he started the neuroscience society here. It's a society for neurochemistry. Uh, I have taken the responsibilities of uh, uh, taking the, the neuroscience society further forward. And I have been associated with him in uh, organizing several conferences and workshops across the country uh, uh, along with him. Uh, he used to travel with me. We used to go to every place and organize the meetings. He used to participate very actively and he used to involve very actively, interact with the students and participants. Uh, especially with the students, he wants to uh, uh, promote the students at the uh, at, uh, catch them at end. That was uh, in the concept of this uh, society. Uh, so therefore, he always encourages to have the workshops uh, uh, in, in the annual meetings, uh, workshops to train the students. So it's a kind of hands-on training. So this has become a part and parcel of the society activity. And uh, by default, uh, we have been doing it at one place or the other. So in fact, this year also, we are organizing a workshop in Delhi, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, 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 Suhail uh, is organizing at uh, Jamia Hamdad uh, University in Delhi uh, from uh, 8th to 12th of uh, December. So this is how we keep uh, taking the, uh, actually the uh, legacy of uh, Professor Subarao, especially in the neuroscience. And we're hoping that uh, we will spread the uh, awareness about the neuroscience and the neurodegenerative diseases so with which he has been associated so i thank you professor anand for the opportunity to say to share few words thank you thank you Dr. prakash so i request vidya now to introduce so uh, professor uh, vidya yes sir uh, good afternoon everyone i introduce professor mk thakur uh, Dr. M.K. Thakur is UGC BSR faculty fellow at the Department of Zoology, Banaras Hindi University. He is former uh, professor and head Department of Zoology and coordinator of DBT Interdisciplinary School of Life Sciences, BHU. His area of specialization is neurobiology of aging. He has published over 150 research papers and two books on molecular and cellular neurobiology and brain aging and therapeutics inventions. 24 students have, have received PhD degree under his supervision and they are well placed in different institutions of India and abroad. He is a fellow of Indian Academics of Neurosciences, IAN, National Academy of uh, Medical Sciences and National Academy of Sciences, India. He has been awarded IMSA Medal for Young Scientist, ICMR Marwa Award, BHU Gold, Gold Medal, DAD, Rocky Fellow Foundation, MRC, and JSPS Fellowship. He is presently President so Society for Neurochemistry, India, and former President of IAM and Association of Gerontology, India. Uh, the title of the presentation is Age Associated Memory Impairment and Molecular Inventions. I Okay, thank you, sir. Request, Mr. Talpur. I request, sir. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Vidya. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure to be associated with uh, this symposium, and I thank uh, Dr. Anand Kondapi to organize this uh, symposium on aging mechanisms of, and interventions in memory of late Professor Kaluri Subara. Uh, he asked me to tell about my experiences with Professor Subara, so I will be very brief in telling about my association, and then I shall tell about uh, my work and share some of our recent research uh, findings. <clears throat> uh, so my association with uh, Professor Subara is uh, uh, longer than four decades, and uh, we uh, I came to know him 
1976 77 when i was doing phd at banaras hindu university under the supervision of uh, late professor ms kanungo uh, and uh, professor subaro was a reader in biochemistry during that period and uh, professor subaro and professor kanungo were very close friends and one of the reasons for closeness was their common research interest in biochemistry and molecular biology of developing and aging brain. And as my PhD topic was also related to uh, studies on covalent modifications of chromosomal proteins during aging, so whenever Professor Subaro used to come to the lab, Professor Kango will ask me to share my <coughs> uh, primitive uh, preliminary data with him. And I used to get very constructive suggestions from Professor Subara. And since then, we are in uh, we are in contact, and uh, we were more in correspondence because of uh, our uh, science societies meeting, like in 1982, uh, Association of Gerontology India (AGI) was established at Banaras Hindu University by late Professor Kanungo as a founder member, and Professor Subara was very actively participating in all the meetings of uh, AGI. Then another opportunity to meet with uh, Professor Suvaro was during SNCI meeting and other meetings which were organized at Hyderabad. So because of common research interest, he used to invite us. And uh, I remember very vividly different meetings like Indo-US meeting, what he organized, and then one brainstorming session uh, so sponsored by ICMR to explore the pos possibility of establishing a center of aging at Hyderabad University. Uh, <clears throat> during 2010, he asked me to get more closely associated with uh, SNCI, but at that time I couldn't uh, agree for this because I was uh, president of uh, Indian Academy of Neurosciences so i told that it will be difficult to have dual responsibility then in 2016 when the snci meeting was organized at ccmb hyderabad uh, i took the responsibility of uh, sparing more time with snci and have been actively associated with snci along with professor prakash babu and other colleagues in 2017 we organized uh, this snci conference at bhu and that time, Professor Subara was quite active, happy, and uh, he was uh, uh, encouraging all the researchers in uh, neurochemistry. Then in uh, 2019, we had uh, uh, SNCI meeting at Jamia Hamdard University organized by Professor uh, Parvez. And uh, that was the last meeting when uh, I could meet him and uh, we could, uh, society could felicitate him. So <clears throat> um, in nutshell, the Suvaro was a great neurochemist. He has uh, very uh, remarkable scientific contributions. We know him as a dedicated researcher, as a very committed teacher, and he always used to uh, tell even us to train, nurture young bud budding researchers, he, and he has trained a few generations of uh, neuroscientists. He was a man of principle, a great motivator, and a uh, very memorable mentor. So with these words, I pay my tribute to late Professor Subara and dedicate my today's presentation on age-associated memory impairment and molecular interventions to him. This is the topic on which our lab has been working for last couple of years. So in the beginning, I will just give you a glimpse of uh, uh, aging population. Then I shall tell you about the memory and its uh, impairment. And uh, then I shall share some of uh, recent research from our lab and demonstrate that how molecular interventions can rescue this uh, memory impairment during aging. <clears throat> so this uh, uh, histogram shows you the aging population. As you see, uh, uh, we have uh, different, this is the data from United Nations 
about the different age groups of the population and as we see here it is the 60 plus age group which is uh, increasing uh, in proportion more than any other age group and so this normal aging population is increasing and uh, this normal brain aging particularly can switch to pathological aging resulting in disorders like dementia and uh, um, as it is expected from or uh, it is shown in this uh, graph it is estimated that uh, the number of people with dementia will rise say from uh, 50 million in 2020 to 82 million 2030 and uh, 152 million in 2050 and this increase is mostly from the uh, low and middle income countries as it is reflected here so this is a very very serious health challenge and which need to be addressed by scientists and the policymakers so there are different uh, factors which can affect this uh, memory decline and uh, <clears throat> uh, like uh, different neurological uh, disorders stroke tumor head trauma hypoxia uh, dietary deficiency lifestyle factors along with uh, normal aging uh, this can all all these factors can <clears throat> impair memory function uh, we have two types of amnesia. One is anterior grade, where there is uh, no, uh, no formation of new memories, and retrograde, where people are unable to retrieve the stored memory. So in both the conditions, there is impairment of memory. So let us understand first what is this memory, which is a very vital brain function. Uh, mostly the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus regions of the brain are involved in formation and storage of memory and uh, it is through these environmental stimuli so through our sense organs we perceive the information and this information is encoded in the form of sensory memory which can stay for few seconds and then it is uh, lost but if attention is paid to sensory memory it gets uh, converted to shorter memory which can again last for few seconds uh, but if it is rehearsed then it can get consolidated into long-term memory which can stay for a uh, very long time sometimes for the life and uh, this long-term memory when there is need it can be retrieved and used so during aging, we will see that uh, in all these three stages of memory formation, that is acquisition or uh, encoding, consolidation, uh, uh, and retrieval. So there is uh, impairment at all these three stages of memory formation. And uh, so what we know very clearly is the external input, that is the stimuli environmental stimuli or uh, uh, perception through different sense organs and then the behavioral output in the form of memory and during these two processes there is cascade of uh, happenings which occur in the neuronal circuit like changes in pro proteins interaction between protein proteins transcription and translation of different proteins and all these changes lead to cellular changes in the neuronal circuit and its function, synaptic plasticity, excitability, and so on. So this is quite complex uh, phenomenon, which is not very clearly understood. Uh, but definitely there are changes in the synaptic plasticity of the neuronal circuit, and there are several genes which are involved. And uh, a very important group of synaptic genes known as neuronal immediate early genes are the genes which respond immediately after getting the uh, uh, neuronal stimulation. So we have studied these genes and other genes which are uh, linked to memory. And during presentation, I shall briefly tell you about uh, these aspects. So <clears throat> uh, besides this transcription and uh, translation regulation of the genes and their products, proteins, 
there are other mechanisms through which genes are uh, regulated and these are the epigenetic modifications like the modifications which occur in dna and histone proteins which constitute the chromatin and uh, these modifications can change the gene expression like dna methylation which is catalyzed by dna methyl transferase and uh, <clears throat> when this uh, methylation occurs on cytosine residues of dna then usually it compacts the chromatin and inhibits the gene expression uh, same way histone acetylation occurs through histone acetyl transferase and uh, these uh, acetate molecules acetyl molecules which are incorporated they can be removed by histone deacetylase enzyme so because these uh, epigenetic modifications are reversible so it's easy to manipulate them and these modifications don't work alone rather they work in coordination so when uh, the memory linked genes are methylated then this methylated cytosine recruit a protein known as methylate, methylated uh, cytosine binding protein and uh, recruitment of these proteins recruit further other uh, factors like histone deacetylase uh, co-repressors like SYN3A and binding of these uh, factors it will inhibit the transcription of memory linked genes on the other hand when activators will bind co-activators will bind to this complex they may activate the memory related genes so these modifications uh, work in coordination to influence the cognitive function of the uh, in brain during aging and other pathological conditions so in our laboratory we use two kinds of models one is physiological aging model where we use uh, mice of different ages to understand what is uh, what are the changes occurring in these uh, memory molecules with advancing age and uh, we use another pharmacological model model where this uh, scopolamine is used to induce amnesia in mice so this amnesic mice they mimic the aged uh, animals and uh, <clears throat> in both these models we test different types of memory and we study various molecules and today i shall tell you only about one molecule that is histone deacetylase which is very promising molecule and uh, I will show you how the expression of these uh, histone deacetylase changes in aging and amnesic mice and uh, how the expression of this enzyme affects the um, acetylation level of uh, two histones, uh, H3K9 and H3K14. So this is H3 lysine 9 and lysine 14. So at both these sites, how the acetylation is affected and then how this acetylation of H3 histone is influencing the uh, neuronal immediate early genes and uh, also the expression of these genes. And to be more specific, we have uh, uh, noted the acetylation which occurs at the promoter of the genes, which is the regulatory mechanism. And as, as the expression of SDAC2 increases during aging and amnesia so we have tried to inhibit this enzyme uh, through different ways and then try to see what are the changes occurring in all these uh, molecules and uh, besides hdac2 as i have mentioned the co-repressor syn 3a is there which also increases with age so we have silenced this molecule also so it's not only the enzyme but also the cofactor and then we have uh, found a new serine protease so it's not only the uh, modifying enzyme chromatin modifying enzyme or repressor but also the serine protease neuropsin which is also known as klk8 which plays very important role in memory formation so from this slide it is clear the upper panel shows the aging data from young and old mice 
and the lower panel shows aging data from control and scopolamine treated uh, animals and as we see that in old as well as scopolamine treated animals the number of dendritic length total dendritic length number of dendritic nodes all the changes are reduced so the old mice are mimicking this scopolamine induced amnesic condition and this is the reason we have used both these models we have done different types of memory tests but i explain you here just novel object recognition test so this test has uh, three stages habituation training and test so during habituation the mice are uh, kept in a, in a box uh, for five minutes for uh, acclimatization and then after 24 hours uh, the animal is exposed to, to similar objects uh, and this is known as the training and uh, <clears throat> then after 48 hours one of these familiar objects is replaced by a novel object which is novel in the sense it has different shape and uh, color and uh, mice are again exposed to these objects uh, uh, novel and familiar objects and uh, allowed to interact and this interaction time is recorded by video and then analyzed by any mail software so as you see here uh, young and adult mice they spend almost uh, equal time with novel and familiar objects sorry they spend more time with novel objects because it is the inherent uh, property of rodents to explore more time with uh, new objects uh, but in case of old they are not able to distinguish between these novel and familiar objects though so they are spending almost equal time we have calculated the discrimination index that is the ability to discriminate between these novel and familiar objects and it is very clear that in case of old animals this ability is uh, reduced remarkably uh, this reduced uh, recognition memory has been correlated with uh, different uh, chromatin modifying enzymes and as you see here we have studied dna methylation enzymes dnmt1 and dnmt2 uh, dnmt3 uh, a and b and then we have uh, studied this histone d acetylase 2 there are different isoforms but histone d acetylase 2 plays important role in memory and then we have also studied CBP, that is histone acetyl transferase activity. And uh, as we see here, this histone D acetylase 2 expression is increased at both messenger RNA as well as protein uh, level uh, in case of uh, old mice. <clears throat> uh, so not only the expression increases, but also it's the binding at the promoter of uh, neuronal immediate early genes uh, is increased in old. So this has been done through CHIP, that is chromatin immunoprecipitation assay. We have used, and as you see here, the binding of this HDAC2 at the promoter of uh, different neuronal immediate early gene is increased in case of old mice. Then we check the level of acetylation. And uh, as you see in the upper panel, it is the global histone acetylation. We have used S3K9 and S3K14. That is the acetylation at lysine 9 and lysine 14 positions. And in both cases, the global level of acetylation is reduced in case of old. And when we studied the specific acetylation level at the promoter of neuronal immediate early genes, in both cases, we find that for both S3K9 as well as S3K14, the uh, acetylation level is quite low in case of uh, old animals. Then we check the expression of this uh, uh, neuronal in, uh, immediate early genes in the hippocampus of these animals and found that at both mRNA level this is through RT-PCR uh, and at protein level, 
the uh, <coughs> expression of the genes is reduced, all the genes is reduced in case of old animals. So because the SDAC level was high, so we asked whether uh, by inhibiting this SDAC level, there are changes in memory and uh, uh, gene expression. So for this, we have used only the old animals, two, uh, divided into two groups. Uh, one was controlled and another was treated with, uh, uh, was treated with uh, either sodium butyrate, which is a general inhibitor of histone deacetylase. This is non-specific. So to be more precise, we used antisense against this SDAC2. And this was infused uh, stereotaxically into bilaterally into hippocampal region. And after seven days of this treatment, the mice of both the groups were subjected to novel object recognition test. And then their hippocampus was removed and uh, analyzed for expression of these genes and uh, level of uh, histone acetylation. So as you see here, in this case, uh, SDAC2 inhibition, this increases the novel object recognition memory in case of old animals. So we have, uh, uh, in both the cases, upper panel shows the data uh, with treatment of uh, sodium butyrate, and the lower panel shows the data with antisense. And in both cases, we see that uh, the, <clears throat> Discrimination index has increased after inhibition of SDAC2, either by sodium butyrate or antisense against uh, this SDAC2. Then we check the level of uh, acetylation for both S3K9 and S3K14. And as we see here in both cases, sodium butyrate treated as well as uh, uh, SDAC2 antisense treated mice the level of uh, S3K9 as well as S3K14 escalation is increased. Then we check the uh, binding of uh, these um, S3K9 and S3K14 escalation at the promoter of neuronal immediate early genes. And as you see here, again, uh, the Binding of uh, SDAC2 at this uh, <clears throat> promote, uh, promoter of these genes is increased after treatment with sodium butyrate or after treatment with uh, SDAC2 antisense. So not only the binding, but also the expression of uh, these neuronal immediate uh, genes are increased following the inhibition of SDAC2 by sodium butyrate as shown in the upper panel or by antisense, SDAC2 antisense as shown in the lower panel. So this uh, cartoon shows how these epigenetic changes during aging uh, and amnesic uh, mice uh, memory impairment, um, it uh, changes the chromatin conformation and the expression. So in case of young and uh, uh, adult, the histone deacetylase expression is low, histone acetylation level is high, so the chromatin is more relaxed, and as a result, there is uh, gene activation and normal memory is maintained. But when this HDAC2 uh, is, uh, <clears throat> in case of old, this HDAC2 is high and the chromatin is repressed. So the gene expression is uh, also inhibited and this impairs the memory. But when it is inhibited, as DAC2 is inhibited in old, then it gives the conformation like uh, adult animals and memory like adult animals. So after doing these aging studies, we have seen what is the condition of uh, these molecules and chromatin modifying enzymes in case of uh, amnesia? That's the pathological conditions. Scopolamine induced amnesia, which mimics like uh, old animals. And as you see, we have studied a panel of chromatin modifying enzymes 
and here also you see that all these enzymes are very important for scopolamin induced synaptic plasticity gene expression changes and memory impairment so here also we have used this hdac2 antisense uh, to inhibit the uh, hdac2 and uh, as you see in the upper panel it shows the effect in memory through novel object recognition test and uh, the so the first bar is for uh, saline only the middle one is for scopolamine and then we have antisense data and as you see that with the scopolamine this discrimination index is reduced but after SDAC2 it is increased and uh, the lower panel shows the expression of this uh, SDAC2 uh, S3K9 acetylation and S3, uh, S3K14 acetylation and as you see in this uh, graph uh, SDAC2 is uh, reduced in case of uh, <clears throat> in case of uh, antisense treated animals uh, but the level of acetylation of S3K9 and S3K14 is increased right so <clears throat> besides this uh, SDAC2 enzyme there is a co-repressor which also plays very important role in this uh, <clears throat> process and uh, we have uh, used this uh, scene 3a we have silenced it uh, through stereotaxic infusion and then like aging and amnesia model we have checked the memory and as you see here that after uh, after this so we have three panels the first one is sam uh, saline treated then we have scopolamine and then siRNA treated so as you see with the scopolamine this discrimination index is reduced but after siRNA treatment this discrimination ability of the animal is rescued it is recovered uh, not only this uh, and this uh, recovery of memory is through this SDAC2 binding at uh, neuronal immediate early gene promoter in this scopolamine uh, treated mice. So, as it shows in this panel, in all the neuronal immediate early genes, the binding of this SYN3A as well as of SDAC2, this is reduced uh, at the promoter of these neuronal immediate early genes. Then, then we check the level of uh, global acetylation as well as the acetylation of S3K9 and S3K14 at the promoter of these neuronal immediate early genes. And we found that not only the global level is increased, but also the uh, promoter specific neuronal immediate early gene acetylation of S3K9 and S3K14 is increased after silencing of SYN3A. So this also influences the expression of neuronal immediate early genes at both RNA and uh, protein level. And as you see that uh, not only the escalation, but also the expression of the, the genes are uh, increased. So after this uh, SDAC2 and uh, uh, SYN3A co-repressor, we have checked a new serine protease, uh, neuropsin, and uh, so this was not studied much earlier so first we checked the expression of these neuropsin in different regions of the brain and correlated this with uh, synaptic plasticity using dendritic marker map to c protein and we found that uh, this is uh, quite highly expressed in case of uh, hippocampus and the level of this neuropsin is uh, decreased in old and this is uh, differentially expressed in different regions of the brain. So what we did, we knocked on this KLK8, both in vitro using hippocampal culture and in vivo in MOS hippocampus. And we found that this has markedly reduced microtubule associated dendritic growth and spine density. This we did through different uh, imaging studies. Uh, and finally, after 
having thorough analysis of this serine protease, we found and we reported that this emerges as a regulator of regulators in memory. And we analyzed different uh, microtubule protein dependent neuronal morphology and protein kinase A Krebs signaling pathway through which this serine protease LK8 or neuropsin X. So besides these uh, molecular interventions, interventions by HDAC2, SYN3A, and uh, neuropsin, we have also shown that some uh, plant products which have been in use by Ayurvedic uh, <clears throat> people for a very long time, like uh, Bacopa moniera, that is Brahmi, and Aswagandha. They also play a very important role in um, uh, this memory process. So we have shown that uh, there is a protein arc, uh, synaptic protein, and this uh, is involved, hippocampal arc is involved in amnesia, and uh, Aswagandha leaves can uh, alcoholic extract of Asugandha lips can recover this memory loss in a scopolamine model. Then we have shown that this Brahmi extract, there is a spec uh, specific extract known as CDRI08, which was prepared at Central Drug Research Institute at Lucknow in India. So this extract can upregulate the expression of neuronal and glioplasticity markers in the brain of scopolamine induced amnesic mice. And very recently, we have shown that it is not only these molecular interventions and uh, uh, and uh, these uh, herbal um, extracts, but also diet dietary components like vitamin B12 and folic acid supplementation can regulate neuronal immediately gene expression and improve hippocampal dendritic arborization and memory in old male mice. So there are different ways through which uh, this uh, decline in memory during aging and uh, amnesic condition can be recovered. So the take home message is that memory is not erased, but this becomes inaccessible in old age. Animal model research shows that memory loss can be recovered using epigenetic regulators like uh, histone deacetylase and SYN3A and uh, other molecular interventions like neuropsin. Uh, so this is the research data from animals. And when this will be translated in human beings, this will improve the quality of life in elderly. And this will be a landmark achievement for the neuroscience research. So that is the take home message. So this work was uh, part of the work was carried by uh, many dedicated research uh, scholars. And uh, this uh, one of them was Akas Gautam, who is presently assistant professor at Hyderabad University. And I'm happy that he is carrying out this work here also. And uh, we had a very successful collaboration with uh, different people in uh, India as well as um, abroad. And uh, I was fortunate to have not only dedicated students, but uh, generous funding from uh, different uh, government agencies like Department of Biotechnology, Department of Science and Technology, CSIR, Indian Council of Medical Research, UGC, DRDO, and so on. So thank you very much, and I again, uh, express my uh, sincere gratitude to Dr. Anand Kondapi for organizing this uh, symposium and uh, for providing me the opportunity to share my experiences with uh, late Professor Subara and uh, also some of my uh, recent research findings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Thakur, for giving excellent talk and uh, how memory is uh, uh, doing its job during aging and how we can intervene on that to recover the memory. So it's a really very interesting area. Uh, so I think if one or two questions, if anybody want to ask, they can yeah. ask one or two questions. Yes. yes. 
any student or any other participant if you have any questions one or two you can Yeah. If, they are, yeah, if they yeah. have any question, they can email me. If they don't want to ask now, they can email me later. Yeah, maybe that uh, all of you can do it. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor Thakur. And uh, I request now Professor Stambler and Thakur to chair this uh, in the remaining uh, talks of this session. And uh, uh, I leave this uh, floor to both of you. Uh, to take forward. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, please uh, stop uh, sharing your screen, uh, Professor Takur, yeah. and I will be happy to to introduce the next speaker, uh, Dr. Mario Skiriazis uh, from the National Gerontology Center in Cyprus. Um, some background about uh, uh, Dr. Kiriazis. Uh, Dr. Maros Curias is qualified as a medical doctor MD from the University of Rome, Italy, and after preclinical work in the USA, he worked as a clinician in acute medicine in Cyprus and UK. He then qualified as a gerontologist with interest in the biology of aging. He became a chartered member of the academic organization Royal Society of Biology in, in UK. He uh, also has a postgraduate qualification in geriatric medicine from Royal College of Physicians in London. Now he is the scientific director of the National Gerontology Center in Cyprus in association with the Ministry of Health of Cyprus. His research is focused on uh, transdisciplinary models and explores common principles between biology, complexity sciences, evolution, cybernetics, neurosciences, and technocultural elements. Areas of interest include robustness and degeneracy in organic systems, fragility and redundancy, repair processes, hormesis, and environmental enrichment in aging, in the mortalization of somatic cells. His recent publications include papers on the complexity of aging, technology, and society, as well as books on hormesis. Uh, his uh, uh, talk title is Cognitive Hormesis for Age-Related Degeneration. Uh, please, Dr. Kiriazis. Hello, many thanks. I'm very honored to be with you. Uh, I just want to make sure that you can see my screen all right, because I had some problems. Yes. Earlier. Yes, we can please change to the next slide if if you if we see it. Yes. Is it changed? Uh, no. Um, no, it's still in the same. Okay. Now? No, still still the first slide. Okay, let 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 me uh... start it again over. Now? Uh not yet shared something with this uh, with this uh, system let me see i'll try it again try okay. to share is, is one of the windows maybe um, okay is it sharing now still not uh beginning to now okay try to switch slide second slide yes yes okay yes. good that's technology for you i'm going to talk about technology anyway so uh, i'm going to talk about hormesis and particularly cognitive hormesis which um, uh, has an effect not only on the brain but also on uh, aging age-related degeneration in other words but i will start first with health when we talk about health what do we, do we mean uh, i see health as the ability it's an ability of the individual to adapt in the face of social, physical, and emotional challenges. So in other words, we, during our life, we have social and physical challenges, emotional, psychological. And if we are able to adapt to this and overcome this, then we are healthy. It doesn't matter if we have an unaccepted disease, diabetes, for example, or heart disease. The, the point is to be able to overcome this condition we have. And that means that we are healthy. And then with reference to aging, basically aging is damage that happens uh, over time. But not only that, it's the inability to repair this damage. 
if we had the ability to repair the damage, then we wouldn't have um, age-related degeneration or as in a clinical sense, time-related dysfunction. Again, it's the dysfunction that matters, not whether we have an illness or not. It's the ability to function properly. We can see from this slide that aging is not just biological and the medical matters, but there are many other issues and aspects of our lives that are, um, have an effect on aging. Uh, I'm going to concentrate on technology and uh, on reproduction, and we are going to see that there is a bond between these two areas. So technology can affect reproduction, and therefore reproduction can affect aging and us living longer. We'll see the details in a minute. So in our lives, technology is, uh, is a big part and it's increasing. And we are interacting with machines. I don't mean uh, ordinary, ordinary machines or ordinary equipment, but digital communication technology. In other words, we exchange information through digital means with uh, the rest of the world. Um, and then there are certain problems with it, but I'm going to concentrate on the positive aspects of this uh, bond between humans and machines. We can see our env environment, the place we live in. Uh, in the past, it used to be an interaction between uh, natural things, mountains, trees, forests, uh, and, and humans and animals. Now this is becoming a bit slowly less and it's affecting only two areas, humans and machines. So our, our environment is becoming increasingly technological um, and areas such as nature, forests, mountains and so on don't have that much relevance in our lives. Whether this is good or bad, I'm not discussing it. I'm just saying that that's how it is. If you see yourselves, what you did today, you did very few physical things and uh, many uh, cognitive things. You use your brain more than you use your, your body. And that's how humanity is, is progressing. So if we are able to adapt to these challenges, the technological challenges that we see in front of us, then um, we have many benefits of our health. And I'm saying uh, in, in a way that I'll explain in a minute, that um, this will have an impact on aging, a positive impact of aging, not a negative one. Just as, a, as an example, we see different aspects of technology who, which are used to improve health. And it's devices which we can wear. Um, they can measure blood pressure, um, blood sugar, and many other parameters. And then um, uh, measure our uh, oxygen levels and so on. And if necessary, administer treatment. Um, for example, in the example of diabetes, if they sense a low glucose, they the machine will administer insulin or appropriate medication. So this is just one use of technology, but as I said, I'm concentrating specifically on communication, digital communication technology, which has an impact on the brain and on the way we deal with information. So therefore, the line between what is bio biological, a human body, and what is digital is, is increasingly blurred. Uh, imagine if we are attached to certain monitors to monitor our blood sugar or heart, heart rate and so on. Health is not just our own personal matter, but it's, it's um, the function of the machines as well. If one of these monitors breaks, then uh, our health will be affected. So we are becoming one with machines. We are merging with machines. And where the, the humanity stops and the, and the digital starts is a very difficult line to say. 
this brings new realities in our life. For example, if we are not if we are not required to do physical work to use our muscles and uh, bones, then we have more more time to do cognitive work to create things. Uh, I mentioned the example of architecture. Suitable ar architecture in, uh, is an environment where all people can live and flourish. Um, we have increased communication. The, this brings share of information, information that is relevant to us and it makes us think and um, improves our social life, not physically, but, but digitally, which is, uh, again, it could be a bad thing or a good thing. I'm saying it's a good thing. Now, this, this merge of humans with technology affects our biology and it changes our bi biology and the way we evolve. Until now, we evolved by, um, by being uh, able to live in a changing environment with physical obstacles. Now, our, our environment is cognitive and mental obstacles. Uh, but we still evolve and adapt to these uh, challenges, um, making our brain and our thought processes uh, more relevant than our body. Now, there are some people who say, yes, but technology has some negative effects on our life. Um, there are studies which show that um, Electromagnetic radiation for, for Wi-Fi can affect fertility. Um, other studies say about the use of laptops. Um, uh, 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 well, let's see this other um, aspects of our biology that are affected. Um, the use of digital technology has an indirect effect on the male sperm count, it reduces it. It increases the chances of testicular cancer and um, increases the, the incidence of male diseases like cryptorchidism and hypospadies and prostate cancer. So these are, uh, are effects of technology on our genetic systems. Many people worry about this and they say that it is a bad thing. I say that we shouldn't worry. It is actually a good thing that our um, reproductive system is getting damaged. And why is that? Um, I'll explain in a second. If we see the statistics of developed countries, we see in countries such as Germany and Japan, the couples that have uh, no children are about 30 percent so one in three couples in these developed countries don't have any children uh, in other countries as uh, as technology and as um, the, um, development progresses we see a progressive reduction in fertility and in Russia and certain African countries, this is as a society becomes more technological, fertility decreases. So that takes the um, taken into account with the previous slide, where I, I said that it is a good thing to have reduced fertility. Um, brings the question: if we are not going to reproduce so much. So how is life going to continue? And the answer is life is going to continue through us living longer, not through our, our children being born and then dying and other children being born and dying. We live longer to continue life at the expense of the reproduction. So basically less children being born, longer lifespan and, and healthy lifespan as well. But how, how is the biological basis of this? How does the production, technology, and living longer uh, come together? Uh, it is simple because if we are exposed to technology, communication, 
we are uh, exposed also to information that makes our brain think it stimulates our brain it puts our neurons under positive stress um, and the uh, and the neurons when they are under positive stress hormetic stress which i'll explain it uh, some detail in a minute then these neurons create substances which suppress fertility but enhance the survival of the neuron therefore if the neuron lives longer the rest of the body lives longer as well and we live longer <laughs> I suggested the indispensable soma hypothesis, which says that if we take active parts in a technological society, in a technological environment, and we help that environment develop and, uh, and evolve, then we become indispensable to the survival of this society. Therefore, nature by different me mechanisms um, uh, will keep us from aging will keep us healthy and uh, live longer so here we have uh, an explanation of hormesis hormesis basically is a dose response phenomenon um, increasing the dose up to a certain point has benefits increasing it further than a certain point we have negative effects and um, we have uh, several examples let's see another slide here here you can see it more clearly that uh, in the green we have uh, an increase of dose of anything any challenge any stimulus it could be food exercise brain deformation anything um, so up, up to a certain point the green is is good then if we increase the dose continue to increase the exposure to the stressor then we have negative effects therefore there is a window of benefits not too much and not too little Examples are nutritional, calorie restriction, uh, and intermittent, intermittent fasting are uh, examples of hormesis because we put our nutritional system under stress. Not excessive stress, but uh, up to a certain point. Physical exercise, when we do exercise with the muscles, we put the muscles under stress, and this creates uh, substances which repairs the repair the muscles. We can even have sexual um, stress, positive stress, social positive stress, and so on. There are many other examples. Experiments show that if you if we put animals into a, into a box without any stimulation, um, their brain shrinks and their activities become less. But if we enrich that, uh, that environment with different colors, boxes, and so on, then the brain, the immune system improves. This is the same with our society. Living in a society where we only do limited activities is not going to help us. But if we have many stimulating and challenging cognitive effects through technology, as I said previously, then that creates um, a positive spread, a positive pressure on our brain to improve and become stronger. So what happens if we interact with the internet, if we share information like now, for example, what we do is, is we are using digital technology to stimulate our brain. The things I'm telling you or not telling you, or the things you hear, or the questions that you have in your brain, uh, stimulate your neurons, and hopefully up to a certain positive point, to um, initiate a neuronal stress response. This means that cer certain substances are produced, which have a negative effect on our 
germ cells, our genetic material. You can see this uh, slide here. Starting from the, from the left, we expose ourselves to cognitive, in other words, um, hormetic, cognitive hormetic information, which is not too much, but not too little. Um, the, there is a neuronal stress response, which creates damage to the germline. And this damage uh, allows the neuron to, to repair itself and live longer. Therefore, with a, a functional and healthy neuron, life continues through us living longer, but the germline, the reproduction aspect of it, is diminished. Uh, I'll try to, to play a little short video here. If it doesn't... <laughs> I hope the video showed okay. Yes. Um, and now to conclude, uh, technology is increasingly taking parts of our lives, and uh, we are we should be able to adapt to this um, problem that we have to our benefit. As I said, the, um, the stimulus to our brains creates the neuronal stress response. An example was video games as well. And we, we are working with older people to help them use um, video games in order to stimulate their brain, embrace technology, and adapt to this environment. Therefore, by doing so, we are able to function effectively with this, within this new technological environment, uh, hopefully with health and less impact of, of uh, aging related matters on our body. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are any questions or any comments, I'll be pleased to, to hear them. Yes. yes. Please, uh, yes. questions to others, please stop sharing your screen. Yes. Please, questions. Any questions? Basically, the, what I'm saying is that we shouldn't be afraid of technology. Uh, use technology in a way to, to stimulate our brain in a hormetic way, in, in a positive stress. Uh, excessive stress is bad. Little or no stress is again bad. It, it has to be moderate stress to, to challenge our bodies. Okay. Uh, sir, I I have a question. Yes. Uh, prof uh, first of all, it was a nice talk, and uh, uh, I was uh, really curious to know about uh, you mentioned that you know as the technological and adv advancement, like we our physical uh, you know the burden has reduced, and the uh, we 
put more times to for the mental mental process mm -hmm. now as we see that there is further technological advancement and we are moving towards the artificial intelligence and uh, now we see that lot of mental burden is also shared by the machines so how do you see that like uh, i would like to know your point of view in that direction that what would happen to the human cognitive uh, abilities and how does it affect particularly when we talk about the artificial intelligence yeah it is a fine line uh, i i welcome artificial intelligence and the progress of technology but only to serve humans not to not to have any other purpose um, technology is here to serve us if that means we become more and more immersed in technology and we use more and more our brain and less and less our body then fine i agree with it there is research not a lot but some research that shows that if we use our brain in a certain way this has physical benefits for example uh, people who play chess chess uh, they have the same um, physiological changes as those who run a small marathon so their heart rate increases blood pressure increases in a healthy way blood um, flow to the muscles increase and so it is not impossible to suggest that using our brain only may have physical effects to keep our body in good condition. So I welcome artificial intelligence and any technology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I guess we go to the next speaker. Uh, will Professor Takur introduce the next speaker? Shall we take turns? Introduction? Anand? You muted. You muted still. Yeah, you introduce uh, the next speaker because Thakur is in another meeting. He will join you back. Okay, so so I'll take over from now on yeah. until the yeah. end. Yeah. Okay, it is uh, my uh, honor and pleasure to introduce the next speaker, uh, uh, Professor Paturo Kondaya, uh, who has a PhD in genetics uh, from uh, Osmani University in Hyderabad, India. Um, we had postdoctoral fellowship at the Laboratory of Chemo Prevention and National Cancer Institute in USA. A uh, retired professor of the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, India. His area of specialization include the genetics and uh, a research summary is, um, is uh, his aims to understand the mechanism of estrogen regulation of gene, uh, gene expression mediated by ear, ear uh, half sites regulation of TGF beta gene by muscle specific transcription factor myoD and heart specific transcription factor NKX 2.5 uh, the identification of several novel genes regulated by androgens in the rat ventral prostate uh, differential regulation of gene expression by testosterone and anti-androgen flutamide a characterization of modified novel uh, three uh, uh, three trepentoids uh, from plant sources for their anti-inflammatory and anti-growth potential and he will talk today about aging microenvironment and cancer progression uh, thank you please uh, share your slides uh, with the presentation now it's still um, showing the, uh, the the main screen not the eye okay uh, please switch to the next slide Yes, it works. Thank you. Please, and unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Uh, the microphone, if I can undo it. No, I can't. You have to unmute yourself or Anand, please uh, unmute. Uh, Professor Kandaya, please unmute. Yes. Uh, yes. Can I, uh, am I audible now? Yes, now yes. Yeah, now you are. Okay, uh, so now my screen is visible? Yes, yes, now it's perfect. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. And uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizers uh, of the Society for Neurochemistry of India uh, for organizing this special uh, uh, event for Professor uh, Kaluri Subarao. And Professor Subarao and myself uh, have been associated for several years now. 
and uh, many people have talked about uh, the uh, association of Professor Subarao with the uh, trendies, the so-called uh, trendies uh, meeting. And this trendies meeting was something which I was first introduced to uh, Professor Subarao. Before that also, I have uh, had a lot of association. And uh, I, since I belong to IASC and used to visit very frequently, and we really fondly remember uh, Professor Subarao's contributions, both in aging field and the popularization of the science, which uh, by way of this conducting these trendies meetings. In fact, uh, about 27 or so, if I remember correctly, every year, 27 years, this uh, trendies meeting was uh, uh, was held in various places in the country. And uh, uh, um, a majority of the time it was in Hyderabad also. And I have attended uh, as very, very large number of these trendies meetings. I spoke in these meetings. So I, I uh, fondly remember, you can see that uh, Professor Subarao, uh, just I want to put my laser. Uh, uh, Professor Subarao is sitting here. This is one of the trendies meeting uh, which was held in IISC uh, Bangalore. You can see uh, many of you people will recognize uh, the scientist sitting here, Professor Ram Sharma. He is was the pillar of the initiator of this trendies forum. Uh, and Professor Balram, our former director, Professor Padunaban, our former director, and Professor Appaji Rao. And all these people were uh, participating in that Trendies meeting in 2008. And Professor Savitri is uh, actually the one who organized that meeting. So incidentally, I uh, would like to, uh, this presentation is a tribute uh, and is dedicated to uh, late uh, Professor Kaluri Subarao. So coming back to, in fact, I work on cancer biology. Basically, the cancer is our major focus in the laboratory. And uh, when I look at, uh, when uh, actually Anand uh, uh, asked me uh, to speak uh, in uh, memory of Professor Subrao, I was wondering what I should be speaking because we don't work on aging. And I actually am a misfit in this particular uh, session because most people speak on aging and then DNA repair, and then people speak on the neuro uh, degenerative diseases or neuronal involvement aging and so on and so forth. But cancer is also a, a problem of aging. And uh, the most uh, important uh, risk factor for, let me change this slide. Uh, one of the uh, very, very significant risk factor for cancer development is aging. So it is said that advanced chronological age is one of the most significant risk factors for the cancer. And the importance of age-related genetic alterations in cells leading to cancer progression is also well documented because we know mutations and uh, other uh, genetic alterations in oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes are well studied over several decades. And uh, with the advent of the new generation sequencing and other, uh, of, uh, other technologies which are developed in the last one decade, we actually do a lot of diagnostics, prognostication, looking at the genes and their mutations and their response to therapies. And in fact, it's all in clinical practice today. And they're still continuing to identify several new uh, different uh, uh, pathways and different mutations, and also looking at the uh, treatment responses in several cancers. It's not really complete. Only few cancers and few, few uh, stages of the cancers can be treated by using this uh, uh, next generation sequencing data, which is obtained as a patient specific data. The effect of aging on extracellular matrix has been largely overlooked in this process of looking at cancer biology itself. And extracellular matrix seems to be playing a very major role in shaping up the uh, cancer progression. And uh, in this presentation, uh, evidences of age-related changes in microenvironment. This is all literature I'm going to present. And a study, uh, our own study on the importance of human stroma in the promotion of the cancer will be presented. Several recent studies have indicated the importance of age-related ECM changes and progression of cancers. Now, coming to one of the very recent uh, uh, 
very recent uh, review and several reviews are there which i'm going to talk about some of them and aging and cancer the waning of community bonds now here what they have discussed is this is a review a major contribution of aging towards increasing the risk of new plastic diseases conveyed through effects on the micro environment it is now firmly established that aged tissues are prone to develop clones of altered cells most of which are compatible with a normal histological appearance but still they are different physiologically they are different in their genetic makeup this is we are talking about the genetic alterations and such increased clonogenic potential uh, results in the in part for a, from a generalized uh, decrease in proliferative fitness and which favors the emergence of more competitive variant clones and they have a lot of evidences to show this in this particular review and many papers are and I'm, I'm not going to the details of the uh, studies which have really contributed to these kind of concepts so finally that this uh, these specific cellular uh, types or genotypes can emerge with reduced cooperative and integrative capacity and leading to disruption of tissue architecture and paving the way towards progression of new plastic phenotypes this is some kind of a interesting argument about the initiation of carcinogenesis process itself now there is another uh, uh, review published very recently uh, uh, the, the, actually this is a study uh, in november 2021 just this month only it's, it's uh, just attend uh, um, uh, caught my attention where aged breast extracellular matrix drives mammary epithelial cells to an invasive and cancer like phenotype they have used mice models for doing this and uh, the aging breast uh, extracellular matrix alone is sufficient to drive normal human mammary epithelial cells to a tumorigenic phenotype while promoting motility and invasiveness in mdmb231 cells the aged matrix upregulates cancer related genes in ktb21 cells which are uh, mammoth mammary epithelial cells and uh, epithelial to mesenchymal transition which is one of the hallmarks of progression of the cancer uh, uh, through uh, in fact emt or uh, otherwise we call it as emt emt is a hallmark of uh, or a prerequisite for metastatic spread of this particular uh, any of these can solid cancers and interestingly they have shown that the lysyl oxidase is one of the genes which probably uh, is uh, altered in the aged matrix and it's overexpressed and this aged matrix is actually cross linked because of this lysyl oxidase and it changes uh, uh, the course of the tumor development and they when I mean, they have locked, knocked down the lysyl oxidase they could revert this matrix to uh, uh, to the level younger level kind of uh, cross linkings these results show that the aging ecm harbors key biochemical physical and mechanical cues that promote normal epithelial cells to become cancerous now another study uh, some time ago last year it was uh, published uh, epigenetic aging which is the more than just a clock when it comes to cancer in this they have described that the organismal aging is associated with changes at the molecular cellular and tissue levels and is affected by both genetic and environmental factors dna methylation a prominent epigenetic mark also changes over a lifetime as part of an epigenetic aging process all this is well known to the aging researchers the authors review epigenetic aging in particular the phenomena of epigenetic drift and epigenetic clock with regard to its implications in cancer etiology and dna methylation based biomarkers for biological tissue age and the construction of various epigenetic age estimators for human clinical outcomes in health life or lifespan are discussed in this review and they advocate that the future studies to assess the potential clinical impact of strategies focused on lowering cancer risk by preventing premature aging or promoting healthy aging this is one of those very important reviews there in another review which is published last month in uh, frontiers of cell and development biology uh, senescence and immune regulation uh, are prominently uh, present in the tumor micro environment here the senescent environment with actually increases the pdl1 expression and increases all those uh, metastatic markers like osteopontins and invasive 
invasion related markers like you know il6 il8 and mmp3s and then uh, new angiogenesis actually is induced by several of these factors and then one can actually look at the uh, tumor micro and man tumor immuno uh, complica complexes changing and uh, they actually promoting the uh, tumor progression or metastatic spread of these cells and another review published very recently uh, which they say that the cellular senescence in the tumor microenvironment and context specific cancer treatment strategies have been discussed in this first journal review and here uh, cellular senescence and cancer development are, are, are well known and recent studies have revealed that numerous molecular mechanisms of senescence followed by senescence associated secretory phenotype induction and showed the significance of senescence on both sides cellular senescence in stromals is one of the reasons for therapeutic resistance in advanced cancer which is very important to realize and thus it is an innovative phenomena to address while seeking an effective cancer treatment strategy treating the cancer cells themselves in fact if i have to uh, intervene and say by, by treating the cancer cells themselves initial successes were there but eventually they become resistant and they probably will not be eradicated so there is no effective permanent cure for cancer we can only manage the cancers by reducing its growth and uh, the uh, side effects or, or, or morbidity so the, this review summarizes the molecular mechanisms regarding cellular senescence and fo which focuses on the dual roles played by the senescence and offers some directions towards successful treatments targeting harmful senescence cells and that is this is one of the pictures i've taken from that review which shows that the senescence uh, uh, can actually senescence stages of senescence can change the stages of the cancer early stage to the advanced stage for tumor promoting effects there are several senescence associated secretory proteins which have been implicated in progression of the cancers in another review published sometimes just a couple of months ago uh, in frontiers of genetics they have identified they have actually discussed about the aging related genes which are associated with clinical and prognostic features of hepatocellular carcinoma they have found that several aging related genes are overexpressed in hepatocellular carcinoma situation suggesting that the age related uh, progression of this particular disease and another review says that the contribution of physiological and accelerated aging to cancer progression through senescence induced inflammation they show that the senescence uh, uh, associated secretory protein productions and they they actually affect the tumor cells and the tumor microenvironment they change the tumor microenvironment they actually these cells probably will be influencing the the uh, the tumor cells themselves and also the stromal cells one of the major stromal cell uh, component of the tumors is the uh, cancer associated fibroblasts or fibroblasts in short and coming back to another review of the aging uh, effects on the uh, stiffness of the arterial of just is a different digression i will relate tj beta to my talk later a very profound uh, of uh, growth factor which promotes uh, 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 extracellular matrix deposition and fibrosis and in this paper what they have shown is the tj beta's role in ecm expression and remodeling which include which includes the fibrotic disease and uh, they have shown that there is a differential expression of tj beta and collagen genes in young versus older mice and also age related changes in the expression of alpha sma all smooth muscle actin which is one of the hallmarks of the uh, the uh, activation of fibroblast to myofibroblast phenotype which is a, a prerequisite for fibrosis and uh, uh, i also will demonstrate now that these are also cancer associated fibroblasts are also myofibroblastic phenotype having a alpha sma expression and it's also well established that the tj beta regulates the activation of fibroblast to myofibroblast phenotype our our work and many others have shown this for from last probably decade also 
Interestingly, exercise, aerobic exercise actually reversed age-related changes in the matrix deposition and reversed its carotid artery stiffness. Of course, these are my studies. I don't know uh, in the humans whether this is, uh, this is probably has been uh, demonstrated. Now, coming back to this lysyl oxidase, which I have touched upon, uh, which is present in the tumor microenvironment, they have shown that the lysyl oxidase, one of the uh, papers suggests that lysyl oxidase is, uh, uh, is important. Like, you know, for example, if you look at lysyl oxidase 2, it has been demonstrated in liver cancers. Lysyl oxidase 2 is uh, mm -hmm. lysyl oxidase like uh, 2 enzyme, which are actually, there are four of them. Lux L1 and L2, L3, L4. We worked on L1 and uh, this paper suggests L2 has a role in, this is also incidentally induced by TJ beta 2 smart pathway. And they actually promote cancer cell metastasis, cancer progression and metastasis. Now coming back to uh, our own work, uh, next 15, 15 minutes or so, I will describe a recent study which is still under review. Uh, in a journal that we show that the lysyl oxidase one, uh, which is a TJ beta induced uh, one in fibroblasts, which activates fibroblast two and uh, cancer associated fibroblast mediated breast cancer progression. So we show the link between TJ beta lysyl oxidase and cancer associated fibroblasts, and then how they promote the uh, breast cancer progression in in uh, NML model. Also, we have shown. Our hypothesis is basically uh, that fibroblasts activated by TJ beta in the tumor microenvironment, which can come from a variety of uh, sources because tumor microenvironment consists of cells of immune region, like you know, examples of macrophages, many other cells which actually can produce and activate TJ beta. And uh, tumors themselves, tumor cells make a lot of TJ beta into the microenvironment. And they may respond to it or they may not respond directly because there are several tumors, uh, solid tumors, which have defective TJ beta response pathway like SMAD4 deletion or SMAD type 2 receptor mutation. And in this microenvironment, these factors which uh, are acting on the fibroblasts, uh, which uh, in response to the uh, TJ beta fibroblasts uh, secrete factors which lead to tumor progression and subsequent metastasis of tumor cells. This is shown here as TJ beta is produced by the fibroblasts. We have actually published some time ago about TJ beta is one of the key mediators of fibroblast activation and tissue fibrosis. And they act on these uh, activated fibroblasts, we call them as FACT, uh, so CAFs. And these CAFs will actually secrete factors we don't know. Uh, there are several factors which are secreted. Our research says there are differentially expressed uh, factors secreted by these caps in response to TJ beta. Uh, our uh, mammary normal fibroblasts in response to TJ beta are common uh, with each other. They act on these cancer cells and then tumor pro progression and uh, kind of metastasis can ensue with this kind of a setup. This is our hypothesis uh, to start with. So just an introduction to breast cancer. There is a, a in, in stroma of the breast cancers, a lot of uh, uh, myoepithelial cells and then macrophages and fibroblasts, lymphocytes and endothelial cells and uh, several cell types are present. And tumor microenvironment, uh, uh, tumor cells uh, and reside resident stromal cells are, such as endothelial fibroblast cancer, adipocytes, all these cells are present in microenvironment. And all these cells will be secreting factors uh, in response to each other. Like there is a kind of a continuous talk, uh, crosstalk between these cells and in chemical communications. Immune cells are also present, like lymphocytes, macrophages, secreted products like growth factors, extracellular matrix proteins, cytokines, chemokines. It's a very, very big milieu of uh, several things. Now, stromal fibroblasts are all the predominant precursor of CAFs. In fact, we know that Kyrgyzstan's secretory phenotype of uh, fibroblasts have increased alpha SMA in the informational wound healing type. In CAF phenotype, they have much more higher expression of alpha SMA. They are much more secretory, and uh, ECM deposi deposition and remodeling is there, which is irreversible because of the cross linking. Now we know that this is because of lysyl oxidase and other uh, cross linking enzymes. 
proliferation, contractile morphological um, uh, contractility, activation, immune suppression, all these features are present in uh, cancer-associated fibroblasts, and which are actually, uh, we call them as activated fibroblasts. Now, the questions we have is that what are the secreted proteins induced by TJ beta and fibroblasts and their role in conferring CAF phenotype and consequently on CAF mediated uh, breast cancer progression? And what are the signaling mechanisms regulated by TJ beta and fibroblast activation and in conferring the uh, CAF phenotype? I'm going to talk about few aspects of what uh, these questions address. Now here we have a hypothesis I already mentioned that fibroblasts make TJ beta and then TJ beta actually will be uh, acting on themselves in an autocrine manner. And this TJ beta can actually activate the fibroblast to a, a calf phenotype. What is the signaling mechanisms in between? And then these calves increase the uh, so tumor progression. Uh, how they uh, happen is something which we have addressed, at least part of it. And now. The, the mechanism of uh, fibroblast activation is well established. Normal fibroblasts act by the action of TJ beta will become activated fibroblasts. And TJ beta reported to be to, uh, reported to induce expression of alpha SMA uh, and contractile uh, cytoskeleton similar to CAP phenotype. And stromal derived proteins such as gremlin, WIND4, our own work shows that WIND4 is also involved, Versican and uh, are all induced by TJ beta activated fibroblasts in an autocrine manner. An overlap in the transcriptome profile of TJ beta treated fibroblasts and CAF suggests an important role for TJ beta in CAF phenotype. To address our hypothesis, we've actually isolated the cancerous switch fibroblasts from uh, human breast cancer tissues and we characterize them, you can see that the and HMF3 cells are normal uh, fibroblasts, which are uh, from reduction mammoplastic, immortalized fibroblasts, which is a, a gift from uh, Professor Jad from in, in England. And these don't express so much of uh, alpha SMA. When we actually treat these cells uh, with the uh, beta, we see a lot of expression of alpha SMA, similar to CAF phenotype. And we actually overexpress TJ beta uh, in, in these uh, mammary fibroblasts, HMF3S cells. You can see this overexpression, and we call them as HMF3S TJ beta 1 cells. And then we showed that the overexpression is present by uh, in the condition medium, uh, the TJ beta is much more expressed than the, uh, the parental cells. Then we did a comparative secretome profiling and then uh, by mass spec analysis uh, of uh, proteomic analysis, we found that the, there are co some common proteins which are expressed between HMF, uh, S3, TJ beta 1 and CAF. Our idea was to look at common proteins which are expressed between cancer associated fibroblasts and HMF, S, TJ beta 1 fibroblasts because we are trying to relate TJ beta, CAF and uh, 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 tumor progression. We found that there are 20 proteins which are prominently uh, uh, overlapping in these uh, studies, and this is the list of these proteins. And we show that the, all these proteins in, in the TCGA data sets and other data sets, we can see that all these uh, proteins, many of them are overexpressed in, in, in stroma of breast cancer uh, data sets. Now, when we did the validation ourselves, and uh, some of these genes which we have found, that they are overexpressed in the cancer-associated fibroblasts and in some HMF3S cells also, suggesting that the TJ beta-induced proteins probably are also common in CAF phenotype. And I will demonstrate one of the uh, proteins, which is uh, lysyl oxidase itself, is important for CAF phenotype and progression of breast cancers in the next few slides. So this is the summary of my data, what I have shown so far. And lysyl oxidase has some four different isosome, isoforms, and then these are all very complex, and they actually cross-link the uh, extracellular matrix, especially the collagens. And these are called ECM modulating enzymes. Now, we show that the TJ beta induces collagens, TJ beta induces locks, and then matrix stiffness because of this collagen cross-linking and fibroblast activation during fibrosis all happens because TJ beta is acting on fibroblasts. 
So we asked the question, does lysyl oxidase play a role in TJ beta mediated fibroblast activation? And uh, this is the question we have asked. And then we show that uh, I'm just summarizing here as in a cartoon that we show that the TJ beta induces LOX and then it actually works through integrins. Uh, um, the focal addition kinase phosphorylations and GSK3 beta phosphorylation and beta catenin expression and activation of human mammary fibroblasts by this TJ beta. So we actually conclude that the activation of human mammary fibroblasts by TJ beta is mediated by LOX, FAT, GSK3 beta catenin pathway. I'm not, I'm not shown the data. This is a lot of uh, several Western blots are there and this is the conclusion of that study. And the next question we asked was cancer associated fibroblasts. If you lock locks knock down them, what will happen to these cells? When we knock down the uh, three different uh, patient derived cancer associated fibroblasts, we have actually uh, by SHRNA mediated knockdown we have done. And we can see that the alpha SMA uh, goes down with locks uh, knocked down and the beta catenin also goes down uh, as a, as a function of LOX knockdown. We also show that the alpha small protein uh, is downregulated in all these cells which are alpha small knockdown cells. Now the conclusion here is from these experiments that LOX regulates alpha SMA and beta catenin cancer associated fibroblasts. Now the question is whether uh, we want to see the role played by CAFs in TJ beta activated human mammary fibroblasts in breast cancer progression. And for that, we have taken these fibroblasts. We have actually looked at these locks, uh, uh, knocked down, and, uh, and then looked at the breast cancer progression. Now, when we looked at the uh, locks expression itself in breast cancer tissues, we had uh, in a previous study from patients, several breast cancer tissues were available to us, RNA was available. We looked at the LOX transcript expression itself in breast cancer, which was much higher expressed than the normal tissues. And we also show uh, from the analysis of the publicly available data sets that in the cancer stroma, breast cancer stroma, LOX expression, LOX1 expression is much, much higher than the normal uh, mammary stromal cells as well. So the stromal cells represent the primary source of LOX in mammary tumors. That is what basically is the conclusion from that particular data set study. So what we have done is we have taken these cells, uh, different caps, and uh, we have done uh, uh, SHRNA mediated law knockdown of uh, caps. And then we have uh, combined them with uh, uh, one of the uh, breast cancer cell lines, which is called HCC1806, which is a triple negative breast cancer cell line. We used immunocompromised mice and orthotopic uh, tumor, uh, tumor production uh, uh, injection into this. So what we have taken is we have taken the cells which were cultured and counted on the day of injection. And we took some million cells of HCC1806 cells and uh, mixed with uh, 20% of the fibroblasts, various types of fibroblasts. And then these cells were injected uh, uh, in the mammary fat pads uh, orthotopically. And then uh, progression of the tumor growth uh, was assessed by bioluminescence and tumor diameter measurements, and then looked at the metastatic spread in the liver, uh, livers of these mice after, after a while. So this is the experimental protocol. I'm just summarizing this data here. I'm not showing the luminescence measurements. It's also a very similar graph we have here. We, I'm just showing the tumor volume. And as you can see here, the TCC1806, this is the kind of tumors it makes uh, 33 days or uh, progressively up to, up to a month of uh, injection of the cells. And uh, if you can see that the HMF3 is uh, uh, basically like, you know, um, pre puro kind of cells, which are vector controlled HMF3 cells with the 1806 is kind of slightly better than uh, the uh, HMF, HCC 1806 cells themselves. And then if you look at HMF3 as TJ beta 1 overexpressing cells, which is the red line, you can see that there's a, a very, very significant progression of these tumors here. And likewise, 1806 plus CAF, uh, which are actually transfected with uh, scrambled uh, um, SHRNA, also makes uh, 
uh, scrambled is actually somewhere here. A scrambled one is completely um, calves and DJ beta producing HMF spaces are, uh, express, are, are, are actually making these tumors much larger than H, uh, HCC 186, uh, 1806 itself. If you look at uh, calf locked, uh, locks knockdown, calf impregnated uh, 1806 cells, you can see that they are almost equal to uh, basically the, uh, the the cells which are uh, um, uh, normal uh, mammary fibroblast kind of cells. This suggests that the calf phenotype or a calf prom uh, promoted uh, uh, progression of 1806 cells is mediated by locks in these conditions. I'm sure there are several other genes also could be doing this. May be a, a necessary but not sufficient uh, uh, phenomena here because one particular gene may not be important. What it also tells is that the tumor cells themselves is not very important for the progression of the tumors, but the the associated fibroblasts here. We are talking about the same cells which are having the same driver mutations, uh, but your environment is different, which is kind of micro environment what we are providing, which is different. So that's why these cells probably are uh, progressing differently. The important conclusion is LOX expression in calves play an important role in HCC 1806 tumor growth. And uh, we also looked at the livers and uh, in the calf uh, scrambled and the uh, locks, you can see this uh, connection. Calf caused metastatic colonization of HCC 1806 much more than what the normal 1806 cells themselves. So you can see this comparison, this scrambled cells, which is calf impregnated is going shows much more uh, metastatic lesions in the lung, sorry, in the liver, compared to the lung knockdown of locks in calves. And this is the uh, normal uh, fibroblast uh, impregnated tumors, and this is cells alone. So this suggests that uh, lysyl oxidase expression in calves plays an important role in breast cancer liver metastasis. So to summarize uh, uh, this talk, one SEC 1806 cells showed increased tumorigenesis in the presence of TJ beta 1 overexpressing fibroblasts and cats. SEC 1806 metastasized to the liver in the presence of TJ beta 1 overexpressing HMF3S and calf cells. And lysyl oxidase knockdown of calves compromised the increased tumorigenesis of SEC 1806 cells and metastatic colonization to the liver. ROX regulates calf MMP2 activity, which the data I have not shown, and ROX not to compromise the MMP2 activity. We have studied this is schematic where we, we see that the TJ beta is produced by the tumor cells. Those TJ beta will act on the, uh, the resident fibroblasts, which are in the microenvironment. And these fibroblasts will actually produce locks, and this locks actually will uh, convert fibroblasts to myofibroblasts, and this myofibroblasts will actually act on tumor cells to produce uh, and become metastatic uh, by regulating the MMP2 activity in these cells. This is what we have concluded. Our conclusions are aging can, in fact, one of the most important thing one should remember, the uh, metastatic spread of at least breast cancers, which we know that the cells are dormant for a, forever, a long time. There are instances of patients who, whose primary tumors have been dissected and uh, chemotherapy and uh, whatever respective adjuvant therapies are given. And the tumor is a patient is progression free uh, for quite some time. And suddenly after five years or 10 years, and sometimes in some cases it's 20 years that they actually uh, start uh, showing up metastatic lesions in both bone or liver or brain or lung. So some of these organs are coming up after several years of dormancy. So the question of why these cells are dormant for so long, what, what one can actually hypothesize here is that the aging actually changing this the organs, uh, like, you know, micro environment or organs of, uh, uh, phenotype, and which actually is allowing uh, the the sprouting of the, the already dormant cells, which are already lodged inside these organs. It's very difficult to detect these cells which are dormant. 
because no matter what kind of uh, uh, imaging we do, because these are not proliferating cells, you can't do PET imaging, they don't show. These micromets are so-called nanomets, I would call. Micromets at least can be seen by PET scan. Nanomets cannot be seen. So aging has a very, very profound influence on the microenvironment in the tissues and organs. And the microenvironment can change the cellular behavior, leading to tumor initiation and course of tumor progression. Because microenvironment changes actually will lead to a lot of uh, ROS production, and ROS production can lead to mutation of the genes. And if, suppose a cell, particular cell, have a, a, a driver mutation uh, initiated because of this ROS generation, then you can have a tumor initiation itself. Targeting the factors in the microenvironment could be beneficial in the management of these resilient tumors. Now, I would like to uh, end this talk by acknowledging the people who have been associated with this study. Uh, uh, Armin Gandhi is the principal student who just completed and had his RY oversee about a month ago. And uh, she's going to San, San Diego for a postdoctoral fellowship. And Sharadi was a technical assistant. Sunita Chopra is the one who originally showed myofibroblast conversion of fibroblasts we published in some time ago. And uh, the Annapurni Rangarajan's group or Ram Rai Bhatt's group in our department have provided, uh, they actually get fresh tissues from breast cancer patients and they have actually provide us, provided us the caps which we have used in this study. And Professor Uppal Tattoo was uh, instrumental in our uh, proteomic analysis, Divya Berry is a student and uh, we, are, uh, we are indebted to uh, Central Animal Facility of IISC with Dr. Ramchandra and uh, Dr. Krishnaveni who are veterinarians who helped us with the new mice experiments. And uh, the funding for this uh, 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 work has been from a CRBTST project, which is still ongoing. We're also funded through IAS DBT partnership program, and I am a recipient of the IMSA Senior Scientist Award. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will uh, end this talk, and I can take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kandaya. Please, questions? Questions? So this audience is uh, different from cancer, so I expect. This audience agrees with everything everybody says. So. Yeah, anyway, I would like to thank uh, Anand and uh, uh, Prakash Babu for inviting me to give this lecture. It's, it's an honor to speak in the memory of Professor Subra. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please also end your uh, screen presentation. And uh, uh, it's still online, just uh, an ice. I Thank you. It's uh, so if there is no other questions, uh, I'm happy to uh, to introduce the next uh, speaker, uh, Professor uh, Kaluru Ramaya, a VA, who uh, was the faculty of the Department of Biochemistry at the School of Life Sciences at the University of Hyderabad from November 87 to uh, 2019. Uh, after superannuation, he is working at present at the same department as a faculty by fellowship that he received from the University Grants Commission. As a faculty member, he served as head, Department of Biochemistry, Dean, School of Life Sciences, Director of um, UGC, Human Resource Development Center, and Executive Council Member of the University by virtue of his seniority. He was an elected fellow of Andhra Pradesh and the Telangana Science Academy as fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, and he was recipient of the AP Scientist Award in Biology, uh, Professor uh, Swami worked by the Society of Biological Chemists India and uh, was also the recipient of a career fellowship award twice in biotechnology by the Rockefeller Foundation USA from the developing nations. Uh, on this fellowship, he worked as a visiting scientist at MIT, Cambridge, and Professor uh, Irving M. London's laboratory during the summer months of 1989-94. Uh, Dr. Amaya also was a visiting scientist at NIH in the Professor Alan Hinebush Laboratory, as was at uh, Raymond Kempfer Laboratory at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, also briefly. Uh, prior to joining the University of Hyderabad, uh, Dr. Amaya did his PhD from uh, GNU, New Delhi, 
postdoc at the University of Nebraska Lincoln at MIT. His research interests are primarily translational regulation in, in eukaryotes, unfolded protein response, protein phosphorylation, and signal transduction, inter interorganellar communication. He was also a part of the aging research team together with Professor Karule, Kaluri Subarao. Thank you. It is a pleasure to, uh, to have your talk. You're welcome to share your screen. And uh, uh, the title of his talk is Translational Regulation. Uh, decline in unfolded protein response in aging. Please share your presentation and unmute yourself. Yes, yes, now we see it. Uh, please Can try to the, the increase it. Presentation. No, not yet, not yet. Please return to the previous. Or maybe also share from the from the windows it usually helps. From the Windows option. <clears throat> you share from window. Window sharing you do, not from the printer. Yes, now it's beginning to work. Yeah. Can you see yes. this presentation? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, please, please just switch to the next slide that uh, we see that is um, can be changed. Can yes, you? yes, okay. now it's perfect. Okay. I want to thank the organizers, particularly Professor Anand Kundapi and uh, for inviting me for this talk. I must say I'm very much associated with Professor K. Subaragaru, Kaluri Subaragaru. In fact, the very first memory that comes to my mind is that uh, I received the appointment letter of the University of Hyderabad way back when I was in, working at MIT, a letter written by Professor K. Subaragal that I'm appointed as an assistant professor in the School of Life Sciences at the University of Hyderabad. I was very much excited, actually, at that point in time. I thought it would be me a way back to return, in fact. And uh, I came and then I associated with him for all these uh, 30 years, 32 years with him. And uh, in fact, uh, one time myself and Anand Kundabi were asked to join this group and then we started thinking how to join. Actually, we have a different expertise, but then we thought we would use our expertise to do aging research, something like that. And we put up a common proposal which was funded. And way back in 2007, we did actually a piece of work. And that is what I'm going to present now, actually. I'm not uh, by actually involved in much of aging research, but uh, this was the time when Professor Barogaru was there as the dean of the school and also the head of the Department of Biochemistry because of his uh, influence. We were actually into the aging research group, but uh, I really like to work with him. He is a great uh, mentor, I must say, as a teacher, and also he's a very good administrator, too. And I have my due respect by him, and uh, I always used to like him. Of course, there are some small here and there minor problems, but uh, that we could avoid 
it did not happen sometimes you know i wanted to i do not want to go into those details but definitely yes he was instrumental for me to do this uh, piece of work in av where i applied my knowledge in translational revelation and to study actually what is happening during av that is what i am going to present today and uh, when it comes to eukaryotic translation i do not know how many of you are familiar with but uh, actually there is a formation of ads initiation complex for that you require a dozen protein packets among them the very first thing that happens is the formation of rp3s complex which is a kind of complex with 40s ribosomes bound together with mfc mfc and eif2 and mtrna i so this is the 43s complex that is formed first in the presence of eif2 gdp that delivers the mtrna to 40s ribosomal subunits and other factors are all important also which you will see somewhere in the later and then there is also an mrna which is bound by various protein factors eif fours at the 5 prime end you have a 5 prime cap which is bound by eif four f complex which is consistent of 4g 4g 4a and 4b and h and at the 3 prime end you have a poly a binding protein and eif four g is a kind of scaffolding protein it interacts on one side with PABP, poly A binding protein, and gets circularized. And this EIF4G actually comes in contact with the EIF3 of this 43S complex and then becomes a 48S complex. And then the ribosome starts scanning and recognizes the start AUG. And once the start AUG is recognized, there is a GTPS center actually in the EIF2, that is eukaryotic initiation factor 2, that is what the frame focus actually is on. The, uh, I will come to that, but uh, the EIF2 which delivers tRNA, that is how it is known to play a I mean, important role in the initiation step of protein synthesis, actually. This has a GTPS center. The gamma subunit of EIF2 has a GTPS activity, which is stimulated by EIF5. So once it stimulates the GTPS activity, then the GTP bound to EIF2 gets hydrolyzed, and EIF2 is released as EIF2 GDP, a binary complex. And this is not able to join metrRNA unless the GDP is exchanged for GTP, which happens by EF2B a zonine nucleotide exchange factor and that is how the EIF2 gets recycled and then of course uh, you will find uh, the EIF5B another GTP hydrolysis takes place which releases all the other bound EIFs and then the ADS complex is formed where the initiated tRNA carrying the methionine is positioned in the P side of the ribosome and uh, there the initiation step ends and the elongation proceeds. Why I'm mentioning that is actually the translational regulation of uh, in eukaryotes, if you see, mostly this is uh, uh, the translational regulation occurs because of phosphorylation and dephosphorylation of some of the protein factors. And two of the most important factors are EIF2 and EIF fours. One of them is EIF four G binding protein, which I have not mentioned here, but that would help in the EIF four G complex to bind here. And the EIF four G BP phosphorylation, and also S six phosphorylation. That is the phosphorylation of the small ribosomal subunit protein. And Coming to EIF2, EIF2 has three subunits, alpha, beta, and gamma. The alpha subunit has a phosphorylation site at 51 serine residues, and many EIF2 kinases actually phosphorylate in here. 
DIF2 on this conserved 751 recipe. And then the gamma subunit and beta subunit actually play a role in various functions, mainly. That is uh, the DDP binding, tRNA I binding, and also in DTPase activity and mRNA binding. These are the various things that uh, the functions which are associated with the IF2, they are all done by beta and gamma subunits. Although the beta and gamma is also now known to be phosphorylated in vitro, but the physiological significance of these phosphorylations are not, not very much known. When it comes to beta subunit, it is a hub for protein-protein interactions. It interacts with various proteins. And the gamma subunit has the ability to bind GTP, metrRNA, I, and GTP's activity. Beta subunit interacts with, as I said, mRNA. But this is required. This is required for all the functions of the gamma subunit also. So way back, it was uh, actually discovered that uh, EIF2 phosphorylation is important in. Translational regulation when people were studying actually the expression of hemoglobin mRNA in reticulocyte lysis. In reticulocyte lysis, although the globin mRNA is there, but it is not expressed unless heme is there. In the absence of heme, the globin mRNA is not translated. And that is what led to people to know actually what is happening, how heme is regulating the translation of globin mRNA that opened up actually the entire field of uh, translational regulation, I must say that. And then people realized that there is a kinase there, which is heme-regulated inhibitor that phosphorylates EIF2-alpha, actually in this serine 51 residue. And then there are various other kinases also subsequently discovered, that is in virus infection, actually the PKR, double-stranded RNA-dependent uh, PKR gets activated, and PKR also phosphorylates, actually, EIF2-alpha. Then came, in amino acid starvation, GCN2 gets activated, and GCN2 kinase also phosphorylates EIF2-alpha. And recently, about 10 years, 15 years ago, PERC has come into picture. This is an ER-resident EIF2-alpha kinase gets activated in response to unfolded protein that also phosphorylates the same conserved 51 residue. So although all of them phosphorylate the same EIF2 alpha, the regulation is different. PKR actually is regulated by RNA, HRI is regulated by He, PARC is regulated by unfolded proteins, and GCN2 is regulated by uncharged tRNA. This gets activated actually in the absence of uh, amino acids when uncharged tRNAs get accumulated and the uncharged tRNAs bind and activate GCN2 kinase. And of course, there may be other EIF2 also kinases, but they're not right now. So what happens when these kinases phosphorylate EIF2 alpha? Then the various EIF2, as I mentioned, is the three subunits, the protein, initially bound with GDP because it has a higher affinity for GDP. Unless this GDP is exchanged for GDP, it cannot join the met tRNA. And then there is an EIF2 weak factor, which is the guanine nucleotide exchange factor. And this one exchanges, actually this uh, reaction is not by mass exchange reaction, it is a catalytic reaction. In fact, uh, EIF2B is only 30% of total EIF2. That is what uh, people figured out when 30% of EIF2 gets phosphorylated, the whole protein synthesis gets shut down. So, EI, and that is where the people try to look at how 30% EIF2 phosphorylation is able to block the entire translation. Then they identified or discovered this weight limiting EIF2B factor, which is uh, initially when we studied, it was a uh, pentameric uh, factor we found like, but then subsequently it is a heterodecameric factor, although all other activities, whatever we have observed, they stayed the same. But uh, now it is known as a heterodecameric. Earlier it was found to be like a heteropentameric 
protein factor where three of these subunits are regulatory in nature and two of them are catalytic with sigma and uh, gamma or uh, catalytic subunits beta alpha and delta regulatory subunits so the gdp exchange is generally catalyzed by eifpb but whenever there are physiological stresses like amino acid deficiency heme deficiency accumulation of unfolded protein or uh, virus infection then eif2 is phosphorylated and the phosphorylated eif2 alpha sequesters all the eif2 b to a inactive complex for uh, where it cannot exchange the gdp for gtp and then a type 1 protein phosphatase actually dephosphorylates eif2 alpha and then can resume protein synthesis so this is the scenario there so this is one of the crucial factors actually which is discovered and the plays an important role in translation phosphorylation of eif2 alpha there is also another protein factor which i was mentioning actually eif4 bp and uh, this 4 bp uh, actually binds to the messenger RNA to the EIF4G complex actually. EIF4G is a cap binding protein and to that EIF4G BP binds and this is under the control of mprc one and phosphorylation of 4G BP actually facilitates it to come out of the EIF4G and then EIF4G can recruit other factors like 4G, 4A, etc., along with the 43S complex. So, otherwise, when it is bound 4GBP, the translation on phosphorylated 4GBP, the translation of the mRNA does not occur. Once it is phosphorylated by mTORC1 pathway, including growth factors and nutrients and other things, then the translation is resumed. How? Because the EIF4G BP comes out of EIF4G, that is the one which facilitates. So EIF4G BP phosphorylation actually upregulates the translation, whereas EIF2 phosphorylation downregulates the translation. These are the two most important uh, proteins, I must say that. And uh, so, as I was mentioning, uh, recently people have discovered the PERC and uh, ER is, uh, PERC is an ER resident uh, EIF2 alpha kinase. And what you see here is, whenever there is an excessive protein synthesis beyond the capacity of protein folding and improper covalent modifications, improper degradation, intracellular calcium changes, then this port kinase gets activated and because of the accumulation of unfolded proteins in the ER and that results in ER stress and it could be acute or chronic and uh, accordingly the cellular homeostasis depends whether the cell survives or the cell dies. So in the whenever the accumulation of unfolded proteins take place in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum, then this unfolded protein response is an adoptive signaling pathway that is evoked. And how is that evoked? ER has three stress sensors. One is the spark another one is uh, IRE1 and then IRE1 alpha and ADF6 to start with these proteins these three sensors which are there which are actually the sense the accumulation of the unfolded proteins they are bound by BIP in ER chaperone so they are inactive to start with but whenever unfolded proteins take place then the BIP is released, it goes and binds to the unfolded proteins and then the sensors get activated, IRE1, once BIP goes out, the IRE1 gets activated and phosphorylated and then it uh, produces XBTM1 mRNA and uh, 
it has also a kind of nucleus activity and this XBP mRNA is processed in such a way that the truncated XBP1 spliced mRNA comes from which you get an XBP1 a transcriptional factor which actually upregulates some of the genes which are important like chaperones, foliages and here associated degradation groups. PUTK is the one, as I said, it phosphorylates alpha subunit of EIR2 and then it uh, in turn synthesizes you know, promotes the expression of ATF4. All the all of the proteins are general proteins are all shut down. The mRNA translation, general mRNA translation is shut down. There are preferential translation of certain messages like ADF4, activated transcription factor 4, that is upregulated. Similarly, ADF6, on release of the, uh, once the BIP is released, it gets activated, and activated uh, ADF6 goes to Golgi, where it is processed, and becomes an activated uh, ADF6. And so these are the various transcriptional factors that are produced ADF6, ADF4, and XBP1. And ADF4 actually is uh, the product of uh, EIF2 phosphorylation. And they bind to various target genes and they produce ER chaperons, foliages, ER associated degradation proteins so that the accumulation of unfolded proteins, you know, they are rectified and uh, the protein folding becomes all right and the protein synthesis gets resumed back. In among these three sensors, the very first one that gets activated is the POC in the one because it wants to stop the ongoing protein synthesis because that is where the problem is. Excessive protein synthesis beyond the capacity of protein folding is a problem of accumulation of unfold, unfolded proteins. So that is where the Perk is the first one to get activated before the others are activated. And uh, this is also one of the things where we have reviewed uh, actually the endoplasmic via stress and unfolded protein response. And the chalk protein actually, which is synthesized in response to uh, EIF2 alpha phosphorylation, ADF4, and uh, CHOP is also made actually because of uh, IIE1 activation and EIF2 phosphorylation. It is a downstream of it. It is a pro apoptotic protein. Uh, maybe I will show you another uh, thing. Recently, what is known as integrated stress response that has come in the picture, that is, various stresses actually promote the kinase activation enhance phosphorylation and that uh, would uh, diminish the 2B activity, the GDP GDP exchange activity and protein synthesis, general protein synthesis is inhibited, but then it promotes the upregulation of ADF4. ADF4 in turn can also produce CHOP and GAD34. These are pro apoptotic proteins. GAD34 is a cofactor of protein phosphate that can resume actually translation again by dephosphorylating EIF2 alpha. So keeping in view of this, we have studied actually what happens to the translational machinery in chronological aging. And when we study various tissues of rats, cortex, cerebellum, lung, liver, kidney, heart and spleen, where we have taken the suckling, ang, adult, and old rats tissues. You can see suckling, ang, adult, and old, suckling, ang, adult, and old. And this code for various proteins like uh, initiation factors, EIF4, EIF4, alpha, 2B, epsilon, EIF5, and also for the kinases, PARC and PKR. And uh, then we also scored for S6 uh, protein, this is the S6, is a ribosomal protein of a small proteus size. And what we figured out is most of these uh, translational components are coming down upon aging. That is the most important thing, suggesting that probably the protein synthesis is the one which is really affected. It comes down. You can see 
in all the tissues actually there is a decline in including EIR2 alpha also declines in most of the tissues here also but uh, it is not so visible but in other tissues you can see there is a very good decline in EIR2 alpha 2 B epsilon EIF5 but interestingly the kinases the EIF2 alpha kinase one of them is FERC yes in fact uh, its act levels were very high PKR levels are also very high. So we thought we would uh, really look at the phosphorylation of these proteins and uh, then we find EIF4E phosphorylation is downregulated. EIF4E BT1 phosphorylation, which is under mTOR pathway, actually that is also downregulated. S6 phosphorylation has come down and EIF2 phosphorylation is down coming down. So although there is, uh, you know, uh, what I say is the kinases are, levels are high, the phosphorylation status of EIF2 alpha or other proteins like 4-EBP1 phosphorylation actually promotes translation. Whereas phosphorylation of EIF2 alpha enhances protein synthesis. What is it suggesting? There are two opposing results you have. One suggests that there is a decline in protein synthesis upon aging, and one suggests that there is an increased protein synthesis. That is with uh, phosphorylated EIF2 alpha particularly. When the phosphorylation comes down, presumably there is more of protein synthesis. But with 4 EPP1, of course it is there is a reduction in phosphorylation. That means there is a reduction in protein synthesis. So these opposing results suggesting that the organisms want to interfere in their own aging process through suppression of mTOR pathway to extend their lifespan and protect them against age-related fatalities and reduce phosphorylation if we have to alpha counters actually and promotes a kind of death signal. That is what we have seen finally that, uh, as I said, this is uh, the ISR pathway, which is important, where the AGF4 and CHOP, they are made, and uh, when we analyzed, actually, the levels of AGF4, GAT34, and CHOP, what we see is the AGF4 comes down upon aging, but GAT34, the cofactor for protein phosphatase, GAT34, the cofactor for protein phosphatase, increases upon aging or in the older tissues. And CHOP, which is a pro death protein, that is also increasing. And phospho JNK is also increasing. These three actually are the real good markers for uh, telling this. There is a cell death may be occurring. So, what uh, the decline in phosphorylation. We have to alpha. We find the relating to the client expression to the and has the expression of GAT34, the cofactor of phosphatase, and the flow that protein, CHOP and phospho JNP. So we also looked at BIP and ER chaperone, and that ER chaperone is also coming down. So decline in EIF2 alpha phosphorylation that presumably promotes enhanced protein synthesis promotes accumulation of unfolded proteins in the absence of chaperones like BIP and ER chaperone that is called here. And that is the cause for perhaps for most of the metabolic and neurological disorders that we see during aging. And we try to also study actually there any inhibitory material in age tissues that inhibit actually EIF2 phosphorylation. Indeed, actually, the extracts contain uh, some kind of a material which uh, we have not purified, but we use ammonium sulfate fraction, and we score the EIF2 human EIF2 alpha phosphorylation that comes down in age tissues compared to the young tissues. You see, so whenever you add the age extracts, the human EIF2 phosphorylation is down-regulated. 
suggesting that there is some kind of a material that interferes with the AIF2 phosphorylation that has something like the IR34 that may be also be phosphorylated in the chain. It's possible, much more quickly. So here it is. There are two things happening here, decline in the IF2 phosphorylation and has just general protein synthesis and it uh, promotes the decline in integrated stress response and also UPR where the IF2 phosphorylation is seen in the unfolded protein response and uh, then promotes unfolded proteins and cell death and age-related pathologies, namely metabolic and neurological disorders. The decline in EIF4 EPP phosphorylation reduces general protein synthesis, uh, supposed to decline because of the NCAR pathway, increases the lifespan. This is different and this is different. So reduction in EIF2 phosphorylation probably is countering the benefits that are accrued by declining NCAR pathway for the alchemy. So that is the main conclusion and later this is our paper actually which we have published with that in areas reduce the if2 phosphorylation and increase pro lipoprotein proteins so what we were suggesting at that point in time is the if2 phosphorylation lack of if2 phosphorylation is a cell death signal but subsequently later actually han et al in nature cell biology they published a paper it says translational attenuation mediated by EIF2 phosphorylation is a survival signal. They're just doing the opposite type. So how did they demonstrate that uh, they have done various studies just like us, but uh, EIF2 alpha, when it is phosphorylated, then it is dephosphorylated by GAD34 or the cofactor protein phosphatase. And if this Presumption of protein synthesis occurs because of the dephosphorylation much earlier, actually, much earlier than the unfolded proteins are recovered or protein folding is rectified. Then that leads to actually uh, that increased translation can lead to more of ROS and this folding of proteins, and that leads to cell death. So, unphosphorylated EIF2 or reduced phosphorylation of EIF2 promotes cell death because of the accumulation of unfolded proteins, increased translation and ROS. Whereas once EIF2 is phosphorylated during stress, then the translation is blocked and this is an adoptive signal in pathway. And uh, it produces also chaperons and ADF4, which is actually a protein factor that plays a role in stimulating the genes involved in the redox metabolism nanoacid metabolism and also autophagy and chaperones. So the ADA4 production is important, which is what we have seen actually is down-regulated during aging. So ADA4 is a survival signal, actually in cell culture experiments. And also recent studies have shown this risk a small molecule which is found to enhance memory in rats and mice by improving cognitive effects caused by shocking brain injury and prion induced neurodegeneration. It blocks actually the ISR arm of UPR induced expression of ADF4 and CHOP that is mediated by POC activation and inhibition of the integrated stress response by ISRIP can significantly enhance cognitive memory and as such represents a strategy to combat memory disorders. So this molecule, which is actually discovered by Peter Walter at the University of California, San Diego, is now under clinical trials actually as it may be improving the memory and so with that I try to conclude a few things. Unstressed happy living coupled with a reduction in general metabolism is the key for delaying is unstressed happy living without stress coupled with a reduction in general metabolism is the key for delaying aging. Longevity that comes without proper health is not good. Aging is a God given gift and in my opinion, I think we shouldn't be interfering too much in today. Just like coordination and all units is important for a proper functioning of the social and physical system, 
biological systems also gain from coordination among the various units. So that is where I say the intervention, it is like I recall, I had an old vehicle where I was changing parts of the parts, you know, because of the breakdown. But finally, one day the heart is broken, the main, you know, engine is shot on the roadside. So is it possible really to improve? Uh, or intervene into the aging process. I think social science research will also be more important than science research to maintain happiness and health in aged population. And our paper, actually the paper that I presented just now, is as simple as I said, BDR's paper, I feel good about it because the important citations and high impact journals presented to PNAS, Aging Cell Nature Review, Science Signal, Rainbow, and Molecular Cell, etc. And I acknowledge ICMR New Delhi, UGC Research Fellowship to one of my students who carried out this work, and myself right now, I thank UGC for giving me this basic science research faculty fellowship, and thank for all your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ramaya. Thank you for the fascinating lecture. Uh, any questions, please? Please. Um, if I may just venture a comment, you know, on the last part, uh, I think these are two, um, uh, they shouldn't be seen as antagonistic, the social sciences and the life sciences. I think they reinforce uh, so now I understand your question. Uh, okay. uh, actually, society supports science, and science will help society. So um, they shouldn't be antagonized. No, but uh, all that requires is more caring and more, uh, you know, they require people really to discuss their problems, which they don't find quite often. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, that social atmosphere that all we enjoy actually that is not there for them and that is one of the causes for their misery true true yes okay any other questions no then okay please stop your presentation and we go to the next to the next lecture right thank you thank you uh, yes um, yes. All right. So uh, the next speaker is Dr. Umakanta Swain. Uh, Swain, sorry, one of the former students uh, who pursued his PhD under the guidance of Professor Kaluri Subarao. Umakanta Swain, PhD, is a visiting scientist at the Department of Biomolecular Science, uh, Vice Minister of Science, Israel. I understand he's now back in India. Dr. Swain earned his PhD in biochemistry from the University of Hyderabad uh, in India in 2010 under the mentorship of the late Professor Kaluri Subarao. He was awarded University Grant Commission um, uh, Dr. Kotari postdoctoral fellowship and continued to work with the late Professor Subarao at uh, Jawaharlal Nehru Technological University in Hyderabad. Uh, his research area includes genomic instability and back excision repair in neurons and aging with special importance to DNA polymerase beta and X family DNA polymerases. In 2012, Dr. Swain joined as a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory of Professor uh, Svi Levne, Vice Minister of Science in Israel. Uh, Dr. Swain has been studying the regulation of uh, translation DNA synthesis, mutagenesis, and cancer. This information is currently being translated to better understanding the resistance of cancer cells to radiation and chemotherapy, as well as to uh, develop uh, new therapeutic strategies for cancer treatment. Uh, you're welcome to start sharing your presentation. And the title of the presentation is uh, DNA Damage and Base Excision Repair in Mammalian Aging Brain Cells. Um. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Stamler, for 
this kind of introduction. I would I would like to also thank uh, uh, Professor Anand uh, organized this meeting in uh, in the memory of uh, late Professor Kaluris Barao. Uh, so um, when I joined in the lab, so <laughs> he asked me a question: uh, Can we work something that uh, can uh, delay the process of aging? So time i was just uh, silent but i said we'll try something then uh he just gave me a smile and said okay let's work something <laughs> uh so okay uh aging the human body doesn't remain at the peak of its power endlessly uh okay. gradually decline wait wait uh please uh, dr swain uh, can you switch your slide to the next one i'm afraid it's stuck on the first one uh it's okay no it's, uh, try to switch again no, no no it's it's not switching like for everybody else maybe i don't know uh, try to um, share from from a window and without going to the full slideshow you know it's this oh now now it's okay now it's switched Good. uh okay yeah e... no, yes go ahead please sorry uh now it's okay i don't think so uh, yes, yes, now it's okay. Now it's okay. okay. Uh, the human body doesn't uh, remain at the peak of its power endlessly. A gradually decline uh, uh, sets in after ma maximum uh, efficiency has been achieved. Every organism which has opted for sexual reproduction must die after performing the reproductive uh, function. There are many theories uh, to explain aging, uh, DNA damage and DNA repair theory in which our lab believes enjoys maximum patronage experimental verifications. Uh, this what this uh, theory states, DNA damage that is bound to occur in the body is repaired efficiently up to uh, certain age of the organism, but thereafter this repair is compromised in a predetermined manner. Thus, from some point in the lifespan, DNA repair capacity decreases. Therefore, DNA damage accumulation this accumulation of DNA damage leads to breakdown of all vital processes in the cells, finally leading to uh, the death. As the uh, native structure of DNA uh, constantly exposed to exogenous uh, and endogenous uh, uh, DNA damaging source. So, uh, uh, so, so, sorry, I have to interrupt again. Please uh, this, move your slides again. Sir, can I have a suggestion? Uh, uh, sir, Umakan, sir, if you share your entire screen, then if you come to full screen mode, we will be able, able to see instead of oh. sharing the window. Okay. Yeah. So uh, maybe I can stop the sharing. Yeah, stop sharing and share your entire screen of the laptop. Uh, now it's okay? Yes, now you can enter on the full screen mode. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, the native structure of DNA uh, uh, is damaged uh, due to uh, exogenous and endogenous source. The endogenous source uh, of DNA damage is uh, due to the body metabolic activity. It is estimated that uh, the endogenous uh, uh, DNA, da DNA lesion, there are variety of DNA lesions, uh, per cell per day, it is around approximately 70,000 uh, endogenous DNA uh, lesion that uh, encounter a cell. Um, as you can see here, uh, uh, H oxo guanine, which is a, a bipolar, which, which is formed due to um, uh, oxidative uh, stress uh, due to body metabolic ac activity. Also, another form is a, a deamination of. Uh, uh, cytosine that also produce uh, uh, uracil uh, that is also commonly formed uh, due to um, uh, spontaneous uh, chemical uh, activity in the cells. Uh, after all, this when these uh, cells when uh, it uh, accumulate this DNA damage, if this is not repaired, um, then it convert to a single strand breaks or a double strand breaks. Uh, DNA damage can uh, cause uh, mutations and uh, uh, cell death. Uh, 
so uh, you can see the severity of biological uh, outcome also uh, increases uh, uh, with the types of DNA damage. So this DNA damage can be a small base modification to a, a bigger one like uh, double strand breaks or intro strand cross linking. So cell has equipped uh, with a well DNA repair machinery that can handle such kind of DNA damage. So uh, you can see the base exosome repair is handled mainly the small base modi modifications. Uh, also, uh, when it's a bigger or del more deleterious uh, DNA damage, is a double strand breaks, which also may handled by homologous uh, and also uh, recommend homologous recombinants, also non homologous and joining. The nervous system uh, during nervous system development, the development of nervous systems occur uh, via cycles of proliferation, differentiation, migration, and maturation. You can see here uh, the phase of TNA uh, nervous system uh, development. So difference in, in while in uh, different stage of development, the nervous system is susceptible to uh, different uh, types of uh, DNA damage. So specific DNA repair pathways are also important uh, during each of this uh, phase. Uh, what is the uniqueness uh, uh, of the mature brain cell? So mature brain cell consists of mainly uh, a neurons, which is uh, generally post mitotic in nature, and also lack of uh, capacity to proliferate. And the glial cells, which uh, also replicate in uh, response to stress or damage. Therefore, neuronal cell in brain of any species at any given point of time is almost as old as animal itself. Uh, Neurons are uh, metabolic, uh, metabolically highly active in comparison to other cell types. Uh, neurons possess really, uh, relatively low antioxidant defense systems. This situation also makes the brain tissue one of the most vulnerable organ in respect to damage to cellular uh, damage uh, uh, due to various endogenous factors arises, arising out of uh, very metabolic activity in these cells. This type of uh, the type of DNA damage that has been seen in the brain uh, cells is largely confined to base uh, modification and base eliminations. So you can see here are the neurological disorders with a, a link to a defective DNA repair. So as can you can see here Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, Hunting, Huntington disease. Also, it's related to oxidative stress uh, uh, and uh, DNA damage. Also, there is uh, uh, there are DNA repair defect in nucleotides. Also, inactivation of uh, protein uh, folata is related to xeroderma pigmentation also uh, in, in also Cochin syndrome that is also defective in other DNA repair pathways. So um, here in the uh, this work actually I'm presenting while doing uh, while uh, this is my uh, PhD uh, uh, thesis. So uh, that is uh, that is in the in this study we uh, use uh, with the rat of different age groups, uh, we uh, group them as young, adult, old, young, uh, and uh, rat is a seven days adult as a six month and old is a 24 months animals. So we uh, isolated uh, neurons uh, and uh, astrocytes or, or sorry, glial cells from gray matter of uh, brain uh, in a FICOL uh, discontinued gradient method and the purity of the cells also checked by uh, you, you can see here the uh, here the uh, figure uh, figures of the neurons and astrocytes also the purity also uh, checked uh, uh, with a neuron specific analysis and also gfap um, uh, gfap antibodies so to measure dna damage i uh, used uh, a comet assay uh, which is popularly known as single cell gel, gel electrophoresis assay uh, uh, the overview is uh, cell is mixed with low melting agarose, uh, then it emulsifies in a comet slides. The cells is, uh, cells were uh, treated with lysis solution, which uh, remove membranes and histone from the DNA. Then after that, cells uh, treated with alkali, uh, which unwind and uh, denature the DNA. Then after electrophoresis, uh, that reveals uh, the strand breaks. Then uh, after staining with a dye, uh, we can visualize with a epifluorescence microscopy. So in this experiment, we used uh, two parameter, comet parameter, the tail length and tail moment. The tail length, uh, which is a comet length uh, uh, minus head diameter, you can see here on the right side of the image, see the tail uh, comet head and also comet tail. Uh, so this is the parameter we used uh, to, to measure the DNA damage, also tail moment. 
which is the percentage of DNA in the tail and also uh, multiply into tail length. So I used two uh, conditions, which is alkaline, alkaline conditions and neutral uh, condition. Alkaline condition generally uh, it uh, uh, reveal the single strand breaks and neutral condition it reveal the double strand breaks. Here uh, uh, in the left side of the uh, 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 picture, I, uh, I used uh, neurons and astrocyte from young and adult, uh, young adult and old brain. As you can see uh, in the in young brain. In, in young neurons, the uh, tail is significantly smaller uh, when you compare it to adult and with, with age, it is also the tail uh, length is also decreases. Uh, so with age, uh, in both type of brain cells, uh, uh, there is also increase of uh, accumulation of uh, uh, single strand breaks uh, in uh, neurons and astrocytes. Same uh, similar conditions also in found in neutral conditions, which also reveal DNA double strand breaks. As you can see with age, there is also uh, age-related increase of uh, DNA double strand breaks in neurons and astrocytes. In the next experiment, what we wanted to see, uh, we wanted to measure the OGG1 and UDG. OGG1 is a 8 oxo -deox DNA glycosylase which uh, recognize 8 oxo guanine and UDG uracil DNA glycosylase which also uh, recognize uracils. So uh, in the experiment, uh, after uh, uh, lice of the brain cells, we incubated uh, OGG1 and UDG uh, uh, uracil DNA glycosylase enzymes that reveals uh, the uh, 8, 8 oxoguanine and uh, uracil uh, in, the, um, in the DNA of the brain cells. As you can see, uh, there is also age-related uh, increase of 8 oxoguanine and also uh, uracil uh, DNA glycosylase sensitive site where, uh, in both types of cells. Studies from this laboratory over the years have revealed that most predominant DNA polymerase present in adult rat brain is DNA polymerase beta. It is suggested that the activity of pol beta is markedly reduced in whole brain extract as well as uh, in isolated neuron and, and glial cell fraction with haze. On a different note, it is now well established that Paul beta is an important component of DNA base section repair pathway, and Paul beta is uh, considered as the key polymerase of BR. Such so unconnected observation led to the hypothesis that BR might be adversely affected in the aging brain and reflect its diminished function with age. Therefore, we have extended our previous studies to examine age-related uh, depend age-dependent regulation of BR using a model oligoduplex substrate containing 8 oxoquanine in neuronal extract prepared from uh, various ages of rat brain cortex. Here is the uh, model of a simple form of, form of mammalian base section repair pathway. This uh, pathway consists of four, five steps, and also there is also core enzyme that participate. Uh, the DNA uh, damage best, particularly uh, recognized by DNA glycosylase, which is called, which is uh, known as the base exosome steps, which remove the damage base and expose to a epicyte. Uh, then this epicyte is clipped by a, a, an enzyme, a p endonuclease, and it exposed to a, a, a three prime OH and five prime uh, sugar uh, phosphate. Then Paul beta is the key player in the pathway. What it can do, it can fill the gap by adding a nucleotide of a strand, also remove the sugar phosphate uh, uh, backbone, then the final nick is sealed by a DNA ligase. Then uh, a measured 8 oxoguanine DNA glycosyl activity in young adult old rat neuronal extract uh, from a different age. In this model, uh, I used a synthetic oligoduplex containing 8, 8 oxoguanine. Uh, its five prime end is uh, radio label uh, phosphorylated. Uh, after treating with a, a neuronal extract that prepared from different A's that is separated on a paste denaturating gel, we have measured the OGG1 activity in, uh, in the extract uh, that prepared from uh, different age group. As you can see, there is also a related, a related decline of uh, OGG1 activity in both types of cells. Similarly, uh, I measure uh, uracil DNA glycosylase and AP endonuclease activity in young adult and old rat brain, uh, rat neuronal extract. 
uh, for that I used a synthetic oligoduplex that contain uracil and also a synthetic oligoduplex that contain epicyte is a THF is a uh, tetrahydrofuran abacic site analog. Uh, also, we observe that uh, there is also age related decline of uh, UDG uh, and also AP endonuclease activity in both types of cells. Then we uh, measure uh, OGG1 uh, initiated base action repair activity in young adult old rat neuronal extract. Uh, in that, in this case, we used a synthetic oligoduplex containing 8 oxoguanine at the 10th position. If 8 oxoguanine uh, removed and Paul Beta incorporate a alpha 32 DGMP in place of 8 oxo uh, DG, we will get a full product. As you can see here, uh, this is the uh, reaction uh, in uh, presence of all the four enzymes. As you can see, the full product 24 more. And when I treated with uh, this substrate with uh, extract prepared from different edges, only young extract is able to uh, uh, convert the uh, full product 24 more. Adult and old uh, uh, repair ext uh, repair old extract unable to uh, convert the full product. Then we uh, find that we wanted to see what is the deficient factor here. Then I supplemented all individual four enzymes, OGG1, AP1, Paul beta and DNA ligase to the extract. As you can see here in the right side, uh, only young uh, extract is able to perform the uh, uh, 24 more ligated product, but other uh, adult and old unable to convert the full product. Then I uh, supplemented the extract with uh, OGG1, AP1, Paul beta and T4 DNA ligase in different combination. In the first combination, I used OGG1 and AP1 as you can see, there is also a deficient factor here, adult and old uh, extract unable to convert full product. Then in presence of uh, Paul beta and TNA ligase, you can see there is a, uh, there is a small uh, uh, product formation when it is compared to young. Uh, also, other combination didn't work, uh, didn't improve. But when I add uh, OGT1 with Paul beta and T4 DNA ligase, combination, you can see there is uh, uh, loss of base oxygen repair activity, uh, restore, restoration of loss of base oxygen repair activity in AP1 uh, in uh, adult and old uh, neuronal extract. In the summary, is related increase in accumulation of uh, single strand breaks and double strand breaks, UDD, OGG1 uh, sensitive sites found in uh, neurons and astrocytes, reduced overall base oxygen repair capacity in neurons is at least one of the major biochemical marker that is associated with advancing age and this activity could be improved by supplementation of recombinant DNA polymerase beta and DNA ligase. Further, reconstituting the BER with all pure enzymes markedly enhance the loss of BER activity in aging neurons. These results are taken to suggest that age-dependent decline in BER activity is due to an overall deficiency of the various factor required for BER. But OGG1, Paul beta, and DNA ligase seems to be most uh, limiting factor. Then in the second part of the study, uh, that is also I have done under the supervision of Professor Rao. Uh, this is the uh, studies on the molecular correlates of genomic stability in rat brain cell following amylica cyanotherapy. Ayurveda, uh, science of life, is the traditional system of Indian medicine and dated back uh, 5,000 years BC. In modern times, it is referred, uh, referred as alternative medicine and supposed to elicit its beneficial effects under a set of defined conditions of treatment. There are eight major therapeutic uh, divisions in Ayurveda. One of them, and perhaps most prevalently used, is Rasayana therapy which means the pathway of essence of nutrition to all body tissue elements to nourish and replenish them. It is the general claim that Rasayana therapy bestow general uh, overall health and longevity. Review of the current literature available on, the, available on Rasayana suggested that the antioxidant and immunomodulation are most studied activities in Rasayana preparation. Thus, Substance, substantial uh, information with necessary depth at molecular level is lacking to create the necessary confidence among the users and this traditional medicine is accepted with confidence. Therefore, we had taken up as a part of national program a study to examine the possible beneficial effect of amalika therapy 
to experimental rats at level of cellular and uh, DNA damage. So in the experimental protocol, we took uh, 96 rats of uh, both uh, sex at the age of six months. So we divided into two groups, control groups, 148 rats and paired group Amalikara cyanophyte, which is also 48. So we have given a four point gram uh, of kg body weight of Amalikara cyano. And uh, uh, we fed for three months. At the age of nine months, we sacrificed the rat and uh, brain and testes are removed for analysis. Similar way, the uh, Rasayana therapy continue uh, extended for another nine months. Uh, also, in that time, also the uh, age of the animal is 15 months. We sacrificed and also analyzed the tissue. Then also continued for another 15 months. So at the age of 21 months, uh, rats are sacrificed and also we remove the tissue uh, for the analysis. Then we uh, measure the DNA damage analysis by cometas in brain cells of control and experimental rats fed with amalika. So this is a representative image. Uh, you can see uh, the age of the animal is 21 months and amalika are fed for 15 months. This is alkaline condition which reveals the single strand breaks. As you can see in the control animals, there is also comet uh, with a, 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 with a bigger uh, tail. When the fed animal, you can see the uh, uh, comet tail also decreases. As you can see in the graph, uh, there is age-related decline, age-related increase of uh, DNA damage in the control animal. In fed, there is also suppression of DNA damage in all the ages. So uh, this uh, same pattern we also found in the uh, neurons and all astrocytes. So the neutral condition we used to uh, uh, see the DNA double strand breaks, you can see in the neurons, as you can see the longer tail, where in the amalika rasayana, here is the tail is also uh, reduced in the fed animals. So the pattern is more or less similar. As you can see, the age-related increase of DNA damage in the control animals in amalika rasayana fed, the DNA damage also uh, suppressed in the fed animal in both the cells <clears throat> then we measure uh, this is a, this is unpublished work the uh, we measure the uh, dna gap repair activity uh, one and four dna uh, by using a syn uh, synthetic oligo duplex uh, by using a, 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 a um, three oligos uh, uh, a upstream primer and a, a downstream primer upstream primer which is say 14 more length and a downstream primer 17 more length after annealing, it forms oligoduplex and its 5' prime end is phosphorylated by a radioactive phosphate. Also, this 17-more uh, downstream primer, 5' prime end is phosphorylated by a unlabeled ATP that create a 3' prime OH and 5' prime uh, phosphate group and is a single strand uh, uh, DNA oligoduplex. Also, in similar way, we also prepare a 4 nucleotide uh, uh, DNA uh, synthetic oligoduplex. So we measure the DNA gap repair activity in a control and amylica cyanophyte rat testis and cerebellum with age. So in the, uh, as you can see uh, in this picture, uh, here uh, in the control animal is a three months amylica cyanophyte and the age of the animal is nine months. Also here is a fed animal is nine months, also 15 months. As you can see with age, the, in control animal, uh, there is also age related decline of um, uh, gap repair activity. The length number one, two, five, six, you can see there is also a decrease of uh, gap repair activity. But in case of uh, paired animal, there is significant increase of DNA gap repair activity in uh, with age. As you can see in the nine months paired animal, if you compare length number five, six, seven, eight, there is significant in increase of uh, gap repair activity in uh, Amalika Rasayan of head animals. So in the same way, we analyze uh, the tissue cerebellum. As you can see, there is also a, a age-related decline of one and four gap repair activity uh, of the uh, neurons. You can see land, land number one, two, and also land number uh, five, six, there is also a dec uh, uh, decline of gap repair activity. But in case of uh, paired animal, this gap repair activity also improved with years. So in the summary, the results convincingly indicate that uh, while in control animal, there was distinct increase in DNA damage with age in neurons and astrocytes. 
Rasino fed animals showed significant less DNA damage in brain cell, demonstrating beneficial effect of Rasino therapy towards maintenance of genomic stability. Age-related loss of DNA, one of the four gap repair, uh, one and four gap repair activity improved or restored in testes uh, and cerebellum of Amulika Rasino fed animals when compared to adult animal. Overall, the results are encouraging, but further validation needed. So this is a picture with uh, Professor Lab when I joined the lab, and also this is a picture uh, when I finished my PhD in my farewell. So I miss him a lot. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Makanta. Thank you, Dr. Swain. And uh, questions, questions about this. No. Uh, okay. So uh, we go to our penultimate speaker, uh, Professor Alexander Stolzing from Germany. Uh, she is a professor for biotechnological engineering, vice president for research at Sense Research Foundation. Uh, Sense, who does know, stands for Strategies for Engineered Negligible Senescence, um, incorporated in UK and the United States. She is also group leader at the University of Leipzig at the Translational Center of Regenerative Medicine, and also at the is with the Fraunhofer Institute of uh, um, of um, Cell Therapy and Immunology in Germany. Uh, that's uh, what I had in my short bio. Maybe she can add much more, and she'll talk about anti-aging interventions. Welcome, and you. I think you're the first one who had the, the slides correctly the first time. So please well let's see if that uh, stays the same um see i'm already struggling so um to try to switch here. to the next slide before yeah we... I, here it is no no to the next one and, and, and still the next no it's still on the same oh i now oh, now, it's, now it's good okay mm -hmm. okay so sorry uh, start again. So thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to speak. And I want to spend some time on aging, anti-aging interventions. Um, just as a disclaimer, I'm a professor at Loughborough University. And also, as mentioned, I work for Sense Research Foundation, which is a non-for-profit uh, foundation that has a uh, really kind of like made it is mission to kind of like spread um, the word that anti-aging is possible, feasible and sensible to do. So uh, SENSE really has as a goal that we uh, think about how we can uh, reimagine aging, how aging could be uh, stopped or delayed, uh, even reversed. Um, and um, so let me talk a little bit about aging and um, get a little bit into like what our approach at SENSE Research Foundation is. Um, so this slide is just for you to get an impression how complex aging actually is. And um, we have now every year coming out more and more data and this, this picture would become more and more complex. And it is therefore very, very difficult to intervene at this level. So mostly this is kind of like our active metabolism, our active signaling that is going on. So one of the things that the founder of our organization did was that he tried to simplify that. And so let me quickly go into like uh, what we think currently. So we all have metabolism. Um, it's all good at the beginning, but over time it changes and eventually uh, we die. And somewhere in between what we have is, uh, is damage. So metabolism, active metabolism leads to an accumulation of damage in the different tissues. And over time, you have so much more damage that you actually get the pathology. And that is usually when doctors come in and start treating you. So historically, um, the, the field of gerontology or biogerontology has been uh, studying the underlying causes of like aging. So different pathways, different signaling genes that are involved. Traditional anti-aging uh, was looking at intervening between kind of metabolism and damage. So they basically tried to uh, prevent damage accumulation. 
Then on the other side of the spectrum, you have geriatrics. So basically the, the medicine that is treating the pathology um, that is usually, if not um, treated, leads to death. And then you have also um, slightly more kind of on the pathology side, you have traditional medicine that seeks to intervene in the pathology. And right here in the middle, this is where basically my foundation is position itself. So what we think is that it is most easiest to intervene when damage has accumulated, but before it has kind of raised its level so that a tissue is actually pathologically disturbed. And also kind of like simply a little bit of like uh, naming, uh, there are a lot of like names around now. A lot of people call this regenerative medicines, rejuvenation technology, longevity, kind of they're all kind of interchangeable. Um, but that's kind of where SENSE really is focusing. And so um, Aubrey de Grey kind of came up with a couple of categories. So he really tried to have this complex pictures boil down to like a couple of handful of kind of categories so that it's making us our life easier to talk about it and think about like where we can intervene. So he came up with seven categories. It's not really important if there are seven, eight, nine or so. It is just important um, that there are like a handful numbers that, that can be kind of named. But what I think is more important and which is kind of different from the, the hallmarks of aging or the, the pillars of aging or any other um, review that has looked and tried to do a similar thing was that he came up with uh, specific um, technologies that is, is able to kind of intervene in that um, process of, of damage accumulation. So, um, to go into it a little bit, so um, one category is, is protein aggregation, um, extracellular aggregates, crosslinks. Um, today we heard a little bit of uh, the role of extracellular matrix that exactly kind of like is, is, is what is kind of this category um, kind of addressing. Then we already heard the name senescent, senescent cells. So these are the death resistant cells. Um, so basically senescent cells accumulating uh, we have extra, extracellular matrix stiffening. Again, like it's, it's kind of like about like cross links in the extracellular matrix. We have protein aggregates. Um, this time the aggregates are intracellular. Um, a lot of like tau aggregates and other aggregates could be kind of put into that, um, into that category. And then um, on the level of mutations, we have a specifically picked the mitochondria because we think that it's the mitochondrial mutations that um, is driving aging um, and we have cancer cells also today we already heard about cancer and then last we have like cell loss so basically um, the loss of stem cells or simple um, functional cells in the body so a little bit on like definitions uh, because a lot of this kind of intervention and intervention into aging has been um, kind of like uh, around the definition of like, what is a disease and what is aging? So just to kind of like put it out there and kind of classify that a little bit. So this is kind of the traditional picture. So you have uh, communicable congenital and chronic diseases. And then usually what people are putting aside is, is what we call aging. But I think what is more, uh, more true to what is really happening is, is that you have age independent pathologies and then you have age-related pathologies. So I, I kind of put them all together in like one bucket. And that makes it a little bit easier to say, yes, interventions um, are possible and, and make sense. And neurodegenerative diseases really kind of like are crossing uh, all, all of these categories. So um, if you think that um, infection have nothing to do with aging or new neurodegeneration, then um, this is this is also an area that is kind of currently hotly debated, especially in the Alzheimer field that like early infections are also drivers of neurodegenerative diseases later in life. So it is just becoming more kind of obvious once you get into a disease and you have really full fledged Alzheimer. So this, this concept that um, aging is something that you can intervene in, 
has not been widely accepted um, kind of like 10, 15 years ago. But recently, um, the concept has been way more kind of accepted. And we also see this kind of in the, in the interest of people in, in this kind of research. So um, this, this is just kind of like um, mentioning of the words, um, of, of words related to aging interventions in the news. And you see that it is kind of like uh, climbing over time. Even nature found out like that aging is now a hot topic. And they came up with a new nature journal um, that is specifying solely on aging, something that like 10 years ago would have not been possible. Um, also, the numbers of clinical trial, which are actually kind of targeting aging or aging pathologies, is on the rise. Um, there's company, loads of companies, uh, specifically also in the in the US, um, and, and the numbers are, again, with a little dip, uh, I guess, here to, to COVID. Um, I hope that we'll be recovering soon. And then there is also like big players. Uh, big pharma technology companies all coming into the space. Um, Sense also recognized that um, spinning out companies and driving ideas into the to market is important. So these are a, com a couple of um, our kind of like spin outs. So um, we have companies that are looking at macular degeneration here, more specifically at, at uh, lipofustin uh, A2E. Um, we have a company that looks at the clearance of senescent cells, a company that looks at protein aggregates and how one can kind of break it down. Um, one company specifically looks at um, crosslinks in the extracellular matrix. And then we have one that is specializing of a um, oxidized cholesterol, so a damaged lipid and the, the removal of it. So um, what does it mean for you as a, as a society that is interested in the brain? Um, I wanted to pick like one example and get a little bit more deeply into it and like look what's currently um, hot in the field, what's kind of um, happening. And because um, it's, it's not enough time to do that for every category, I picked synolytics because that's um, um, an area that speci specifically for the brain has been kind of very successful and very active. So again, cellular senescence, uh, maybe for most of you, just a reminder, so senescent cells are cells that are terminally um, stopped proliferating. Um, there is a lot of things happening in these cells. There are a lot of changes. Um, you have DNA damage accumulating in these cells. You have liposomal um, protein aggregates um, accumulating. Um, the cells are producing a secretine uh, phenotype with a lot of like factors um, that are influencing the surrounding matrix and the surrounding cells. Um, they are apoptosis resistance and have many, many more kind of features that make them really special. Um, but it's not all bad, uh, the thing about the senescence. So um, I also wanted to highlight that there might actually be aspects about senescence that are beneficial. So while usually we are, when we talk about aging and senescence, we, we're looking at like the accumulation of senescent cells over time um, that is interfering with the um, organ function. But there are also um, functions of senescence that are beneficial. And one is that it is actually um, stopping cells, uh, cancerous cells from like spreading and growing too much. Um, it has also been involved in fertility and wound healing. <coughs> so senescence, um, careful. It's not all bad and one has to like careful look at like how to actually uh, target it. But uh, let's go a little back, uh, back when how, how the field started. So first, just as an explanation for this word, senolytics are actually drugs um, that are targeting specifically senescent cells. So um, the, I would say the really groundbreaking experiment was from Baker in 2011. Um, he had a genetic model, a transgenic mouse model um, that had a P16 um, driven um, inducible killing um, of, of cells. 
So by giving a drug, uh, he could activate the, 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 the construct and basically kill off all P16 positive cells. And surprisingly, what he found was um, that um, the cells, uh, the, not the cells, the mice actually lived longer. And later on, oh, sorry, there's an accident here. There should be a different picture, sorry. Later on, it, just imagine it's a similar picture here for the, for the Baker paper. Um, later that was um, repeated with a, a compound and they also found that's a combination of the zatinib and quercetine. They also found that giving a drug, they could also uh, see that mice are living living longer. So that was really kind of like how the field was kind of born and like the discovery around um, other compounds that can um, drive senescent cells that are usually apoptosis resistant to still go into apoptosis. And here are just some names of the field. So the zatinib, quercetine, um, compounds that are kind of like um, interfering with p53 and other other proteins some that are targeting the uh, bclx pathway and basically every day there's another compound that is is kind of coming up and has a slightly different kind of signal pathway that is uh, that it's interfering with i am um, to give you an idea of like how big the industry is really nowadays is like this is just an example is unity biotech um, it's an 85 million uh, 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 strong um, you know, company. So it's it's kind of really having like a ton of patents. Um, it's also um, driving um, their technology towards uh, the, the clinic. So here they had um, one syn synolytic that's called Nutlin that is interfering with the binding of MDM2 to P53. And um, if you disrupt this binding, you basically can drive senescent cells into apoptosis. Um, they, they looked in, um, again, in a transgenic mouse model um, to kind of see if cartilage in the knee would actually be a good target for them. So they were looking for something that was localized uh, because I think they were very cautious. They didn't want to give the synergic kind of like systemically. Um, and they did find that, yes, with aging um, and, and with induction, you, you find an accumulation with, with senescent cells in the knee. And then if you kill them off um, by, by giving a drug, you can actually get rid of these cells. So it's also here um, uh, looking at like, the, the, again, like this is a cartilage staining. Um, if, you, if you kind of remove the senescent cells, the cartilage is actually regenerating. And the data looked all very good. Um, they went into phase one clinical trial um, with local injections into the knee. It was all safe and good. And then they progressed to like a phase two. But unfortunately, um, one has to see that um, there wasn't really anything um, um, therapeutically um, that was kind of like um, significant. So they used a pain-based um, judgment of like uh, how much pain the patient actually had. And unfortunately, there was no difference in the, in the group. So um, we, we have to see, yes, um, um, translation is being uh, driven and has been very quick, um, but there also are a couple of like drawbacks and, and failures. And we have to actually see kind of like what is happening um, um, with the field overall. But let's switch to the brain because that's kind of what probably you are most interested in. And like, let's see a little bit of like what's what's happening with senescence in the brain. And so um, we, I, I was always a big fan of the microglia cells. So very interested in like the role of microglia in aging. And um, so we kind of made an in vitro model of it. Um, we used doxorubicin to induce um, what we think is senescence um, because there is a lot of debate in the field if um, macrophages slash microglia cells actually can become senescence and how much they have already kind of naturally markers that we would be usually seeing as senescence marker. Um, but here is kind of beta gal staining, so a very classical um, senescence marker. And um, after doxorubicin induction, um, the cells really become massively um, larger in size and the lysosomes become larger. And also, if you look for other kind of classical senescence marker like P16, DNA damage, um, lysosomal uh, integrity. So all of this kind of like um, um, gets, gets kind of larger and, and more, 
accumulate in, in these cells after the induction. And most importantly, especially for microglia cells, because they very, very actively kind of communicate with their surrounding is, is like what's happening with SASP. So we, um, we had like a cool culture system where we had senescent cells in the top and then normal microglia cells that were uh, not activated at all, like at the bottom. And uh, we measured what's kind of like being uh, released by these cells. And also what happens with this with these activated cells here at the bottom after they have been co-cultured. So first uh, we see that senescent um, microglia cells really actively uh, produce uh, pro-inflammatory factors. And then the cells that have been exposed to these senescent microglia cells also start producing these factors. So um, senescent microglia are pretty bad in the brain because the, what it looks like is, is that they are spreading uh, pretty quickly. So that senescence becomes kind of like induced in, in, in cells surrounding them. And uh, this is kind of how the, the, how the cells really look. Again, like they are pretty large. And then if the non-senescent cells are getting exposed to, S S a, um, to the SAS, they actually because first become activated, they become kind of like rounded um but i would think that if you would be kind of watching this over time they would also turn into a phenotype that looks very much like this also if you look at the proteome of these senescent cells you see the classical uh, kind of like um, proteins being upregulated and significantly changed in these cells so protein synthesis is messed up um, rna damage is messed up uh, cell death and survival has been upregulated. So very classical kind of like senescent cells. So I think we can very positively say that these microglia cells have a senescent phenotype. And people have been, again, like catching up very quickly and looked at also the other cell types in the brain that could potentially become senescent. And um, so this is kind of the astrocyte. Um, they also have now papers out showing this astrocyte as senescence. The oligodendrocytes can be senescence. The endothelial cells um, um, making up the brain barrier are senescence. And all of these cells together definitely have a negative impact on, on the neurons. So there is a lot of like senescence apparently uh, present in, in, the, in the brain. So with that kind of knowledge uh, in the background, I think people moved very quickly into like animal models. And here is one model where they looked at Alzheimer and they use the most kind of used combination um, that is currently kind of in the scientific field. And again, it's dasatinib and quercetine. And um, they fed the mice uh, with these crude compounds and then looked at um, the, the size of the plaques on the amyloid plaques. And you see that it's massively dropping. Um, they also looked at um, mean intensity of the plaques. It's dropping. So um, they also produce more IL-6 which is kind of, again, like um, a pro-inflammatory marker. Um, they look at A beta 42 um, in the hippocampus, for example, again, with um, treatment of D and Q, it's kind of reduced. And then I think most importantly, they looked at behavior. So here, again, they had like a, a platform, a water platform, very classical experiment to look at memory and um, under D and Q, um, the mice were much quicker in finding uh, finding the platform in the water again. So it looks like, yes, uh, senolytics do kind of like play a role here. And um, here's an alternative one. Um, here they used, uh, again, like a genetic uh, mouse model uh, where you can kill uh, P16 positive cells. And they looked a little bit in, in comparison. So AP means like this was a drug that was inducing the cell killing. And then in alternative, they used that D, D and Q in parallel to, I think, basically judge a little bit like how good D and Q is in killing off all of the senescent cells. So now if you look a little bit uh, here, they look at um, the level of P21 uh, positive neurons. And if you induce um, the promoter to kill off P16 positive cells, yes, you get a reduction. And interesting, you see that with DNQ, the synolytics, it's not as good. Um, so definitely, um, synolytics are not yet perfect. They don't kill off all of the senescent cells, um, but they do have uh, some positive effects. Um, so here, they looked at microglia. So basically, at like 
how swollen the microglia cells are in the brain. And again, uh, with giving the drugs, it's, it's very effective. And interestingly, with T, D, and Q, you get even more of effect. So it seems that um, the salinitics are not only killing off cells and repairing the brain, um, it's also maybe here an effect of um, what we call cinomorphic, where the effect is, is basically on the cell and how the cell is behaving and not so much killing the cells. Again, if you look at behavior, here they had a very complex maze. Um, they looked like how, how quickly um, or how good the, the mice were at like finding, finding the way out of the maze. And um, again, uh, with the genetic um, ablation of senescent cells, it was kind of okay and it was very similar to the to the DNQ. So in general, it looks like synolytics are not yet as maybe good as genetic. Um, and there's definitely also some side effects on, on synolytics. It's not that they are perfectly um, developed yet. Um, the field is pretty, pretty young. So again, I'm, I'm coming back to that question, like um, senescence, um, maybe it's beneficial. Here there is an experiment where they looked at wound sizes. Um, so basically showing that if you ablate all senescent cells, you have you end up with wounds that are larger. So one has to think about this as a it's it's not a full stop, like you can't use analytics. It's more like you have to think about like when you are applying it, you have to like be kind of clever about it. And um, as already said, like synolytics are not yet perfectly developed. A lot of the synolytics that are currently being investigated are coming actually from the cancer field. They're kind of old. Uh, partially failed cancer drugs that are being used at a lower concentration. And they are not without side effects. Um, but I think people are very, very hard working on like modifying it to make the cell, the synolytics more specific and um, kind of um, tackling the, the toxicity side of it. But will it be all good? I mean, have we not been here before? Like, um, I, I just kind of want this to kind of be a, a cautionary tale. Um, we, we have the free radical theory of aging. So um, come up uh, in, in 1950, um, ROS as a byproduct of metabolism. It's a bad thing. People thought um, ROS is, is linked to an accelerated age-related pathology and we have something against it. So we just give uh, antioxidants they scavenge the ROS, everything is, is great, everything is good. And um, what we have seen happening, and, and sorry that I don't have like a kind of brain appropriate example here. I could only find like numbers for the cardiologists, but they, they kind of like recommended to give vitamin E supplements um, to their patients and also they themselves were taking it. And then research progress, and we could find that vitamin E is actually not that helpful, even potentially harmful. So kind of like it switched a little bit, and then um, they didn't really learn anything from it. Like in 2010, um, you now look again at the numbers of the cardiologists, and they, they, they still are kind of like recommending supplements. The type of supplements has switched a little bit, but the concept is basically still the same. So kind of like um, we haven't really learned from our mistakes. And I just want to be kind of cautionable about like synolytics. So I don't want to push the field too much forward without being kind of like looking at like side effects. And, and if they are failure, are there real failures? Or is there kind of like side effects that we, we have not thought about it? Um, so just as a kind of like caution don't over expect uh, what what synolytics can kind of deliver don't think this is now the cure for everything and all and then be disappointed if there are kind of like drawbacks or kind of side effects that we haven't anticipated because we're still learning a lot about senescent cells nowadays and i think the the tool of synolytics has given us a lot of more understanding that there is actually a variety of different senescent cell types out there so kind of the field is actually um, very actively the, um, evolving. So as a, as a summary and message uh, to, to, to you is, is um, that anti, I, I consider anti-aging as a necessary step in tackling all non-congenital and con, non-congenital diseases. And anti-aging, there is now a, a 
kind of a consensus in the field that a limited number of target categories exist and they can be intervened with. Um, the the anti-aging field has matured now into the medical space, um, but still encounters scientific and policy changing challenges um, um, on that journey. And um, if we if we kind of anti-aging will fail if we lose uh, the focus on targeting the damage control and um, take the, uh, the approach of a messing with the met metabolism, um, going back to the Ross um, kind of um, cautionary tale. And for me, anti-aging is a side effect. It's not the aim of regenerative medicine. So on that discussion that was kind of slightly touched upon earlier to, to today um, is like, uh, yes, we always want people to be healthy. Um, that is definitely the goal on, of, on regenerative medicine. Uh, no one wants to be um, alive and suffering at the same time. And with that one, um, I want to stop and hope that you have some questions for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for the fascinating lecture. Uh, questions, please. Yes, yeah. please. Uh, do you have any targeted deliveries for the Sensex cells? Anybody develop targeted deliveries? Um, yes, they are the the start of like targeted delivery. There is a galactose modified nabitoclax, for example. So the galactose make it kind of specific for the lysosome. So only cells that have a lot of galactosidase activity can actually kind of like free up um, the, the nabitoclax. And there is also now like the beginning of some antibody delivery. Um, the the kind of development has um, been a bit difficult because we don't really have very well defined senescent cell surface marker. But the moment we have kind of fixed that problem, I think uh, specific delivery will not be as much of a problem. But people are after going after that um, target. Yes. Thank you. Uh, is there a way where you can encapsulate for slow and sustained release? to put down the adverse effect? I have not seen it. It's a very great idea. Um, I hope some uh, some nanomaterial scientists come up with a good way of doing it, um, but I have not seen it yet. Okay, thank you. Which reminds me, I was too quick with my last slide. Uh, we also have grant uh, opportunities, so Sense Research Foundation is also a foundation that gives out um, research grant. So uh, please, if there are someone that wants to work on anti-aging and interventions, uh, please write us a message. There's a lot of information on our homepage and we would be very happy to receive grants from India. Thank you. Awesome. Other questions? Uh, uh, Nea, yes. Nea, uh, please, you... Hel the... Hello, ma'am. Oh. Hi. Ma'am, I wanted to ask that how these synolytic compounds are being delivered into animals. Like, uh, are they being uh, delivered into blood or uh, directly into the brain? Um, in the moment, they are mostly just IV. Um, so... Uh, systemic injections. No one has done yet a specific localized injection into the brain. Uh, so these uh, compounds may not be like uh, crossing the blood brain barrier. Uh, I can't speak for all of the synolytics, but a lot of the synolytics uh, can uh, cross the blood brain barrier. Uh, so bioavailability has usually been checked on these compounds, uh, but they are definitely compounds that are better at it and worse at it is. And yes, a localized delivery might be of interest, um, but I think I have not seen a lot on it. Okay. And one more thing, ma'am, like how these senolytic drugs are able to differentiate between a senescent and a normal cell? They don't. Um, there is always also killing of normal healthy cells happening. It's just that um, the senescent cells have some uh, factors upregulated that make them more easy to die. So the drugs are really not yet very specific and we always have off-target effects. And that's probably also why uh, in the clinic, we still see the, these kind of like side effects popping up. So unfortunately, no, we're not really yet um, very specific for the senescent cells. It's just making 
use of like, for example, the size of the lysosomes or other features that make a senescent cell and senescent cell. Okay, thank you, ma'am. All right, no one, one last question. If no, uh, we still uh, have uh, Professor William Bohr uh, in the program. Is he here? We're joining at 7.30. Uh, so what I will do is another 10 minutes, I will just briefly outline what uh, we have collaborated with uh, Professor Bohr. Is that okay? Yes, yes, please. Okay. I'll try to be quick in my slides, so stop me wherever. Are you able to see my slides? Yes, yes, great. Yeah, uh, actually, I worked on neural sensors and DNA repair uh, in collaboration with Professor Barrow uh, when he was here in the university. So, the brain aging uh, is uh, increased oxidative stress and accumulation of damaged molecules and uh, promote dysfunction. And others are affecting some of the signaling process, such as gene transcription and also calcium homeostasis and protein misfolding and DNA repair. That regulate brain aging, and some of the neurological diseases are considered to be high risk with the uh, increased age. And uh, example like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and uh, the the cause of various uh, neurological diseases so is not clear. Uh, because a lot of several mechanisms are there, and uh, the explained molecular event that control neuronal cell death is critical for the development of new strategies for helping prevent and treat neurological diseases and aging. So, in this regard, a lot of mechanisms are suggested, and uh, like a telomere shortening, or outer stress, gene damage, and oncogenes. So, the what uh, we have taken up two aspects uh, in the collaboration with Professor Brown, and uh, one is uh, uh, on the development of a in vitro model for studying aging and senescence. Second is understanding what are the genes that are responsible for the senescence. Uh, so, in this regard, I uh, will quickly go through. So, why we need to develop a cell culture model? Because uh, that that uh, will help us in identifying a molecular molecules specific to a particular cell type. So, that is the reason why we picked up this and we used uh, uh, the granule neurons as a in vitro culture granule neurons as a model. And where we use this SS, if somebody is joining, let me say it. Yeah, Dr. Bohr joins. I try to be as quick as possible. Uh, uh, the, so the senescence in this case, what we did was we used uh, granular neurons as I explained to you, and these are the granular neurons cultured. And then we tried to culture them. The granular neurons survived for five weeks in culture. And then uh, these are, so they will be, after five weeks, they die. So you can see right side uh, the corresponding uh, protein levels. So the uh, so senescence so when you when you monitor senescence you see the senescence cells saturate uh, in, by five weeks you have the beta gal positive cells so where you see a lot of senescence you observe and then uh, you also see cell death uh, for five weeks and uh, then uh, uh, when you look at the DNA damage there's increase in DNA damage over aging and uh, then uh, uh, you also see intercell intercellular calcium levels. There's increase in calcium levels, like uh, you see in the aging uh, phenomena, people have shown. And also the mitochondrial stress, uh, you can see with aging. So it simulates like natural aging. And uh, the ROIs also, you see an increase with aging, with the weeks in culture. So all these markers, so you also see thiol estimation when you look. So there's a decrease in thiol, estimate thiol over the, and saturates at the fifth week. And uh, the, uh, another important feature is uh, when you look into NHEJ pathway, one of the pathways is very predominant in the neurons. So in the, in the in these neurons, you see that uh, the multimerization you know, the takes place over the age, over the age, you can see. 
and uh, where you can see here the multimers formation. So this is a multiplication. Trimers and all. Uh, these are trimers and uh, multiplication. So over H, you can, so that means the NHJ. So here is NHJ activity is very high and it is coming down over the H. So then uh, we have, we also did uh, the BER activity. I will only show this uh, gel where we showed that BER activity also will uh, decrease over the age in the age and neurons. So which is, uh, you, which you can comparable with the young and adult and old brains. So there also you see a decrease in age. So, uh, so you, you also looked into other BER engines. I'll just not show this data because of the uh, very short time I'm taking here. So the, we also looked into topoisomerizers, various topoisomerizers that are involved. And what we found was topoisomerase to beta uh, level decreases uh, over the age. I will only consider this particular marker in this case. And we also observed that the topo to beta increases, decreases over the age. And uh, you can see with aging and correspondingly both the mRNA level as well as uh, the protein level decreases. And uh, the, when you when you overexpress topo to beta, well, what we observed is the survival increases. So when you have uh, the control cells without topo to beta overexpression, when you have the control neurons with the expression of uh, uh, topo to beta uh, uh, overexpressed transformed cells neurons, where you see the there is an increase. So there is a topo to beta will provide a survival advantage to neurons. And uh, the, we also looked into mechanisms. So these details, I will not go. So another important study. So we also observed that uh, the topo to beta uh, media binds to the 270, 280, and, uh, uh, and also co-localizes gamma H2X, showing that it is localizes at the, uh, the stand breaks. And then where it forms a complex, and then allows maybe there is a torsional uh, uh, there may be requirement of uh, uh, resolution of torsional stress, so that may be total to be beta may be involved there. So another import, uh, so this uh, also I'll skip. So another important uh, study which I want to tell you. So we studied, a com we compared the genes that are uh, expressed in different uh, weeks, uh, uh, different weeks uh, uh, during the growth. And these genes, when we looked at, we are we used the supervised learning method. To compare, I will not explain all this because uh, that will take time. So then, uh, what we ident we identified six genes: A to M and GNA for fourteen, and uh, G GRIA one and MST one and NPY and SLIP two. And then we, when we looked at these genes and uh, then further analyzed uh, their uh, network the interactions, and then what we when we cultured the new the neurons and then we downregulated the uh, these genes, whatever genes we selected, and then we looked into the corresponding. So when we took the genes, this is a downregulated sensation sensitivity. So when you take the uh, corresponding uh, proteins, so when you when you knock down, and you see the kind of uh, the uh, when you have uh, the sensation gene when you downregulate. So this kind of downregulation. This is in case of uh, control. So when you don't, when you transform at third week and this is how the level decreases. It's not we could not completely knock down because of uh, uh, the. So what we found was even with this uh, partial knockdown, what we have observed is in case of uh, neurons, so we observed one week increase in the survival. There is a one week increase in survival we observed when we knocked down sleep two and NPY. When we knocked down sleep two and NPY, we observed this increase in survival. Whereas all other genes, we don't see any benefit. And further, uh, when you analyze the, the corresponding uh, uh, the senescence also, we see in the slit two, we see there is increase in the, uh, sorry for this. Uh, so there is increase in the senescence, uh, senescence pattern. So you can see there's the increase in cell survival with senescence. So you also observe uh, both in the case of DNA damage, you observed at sixth week also. And uh, same thing, you also observe uh, the the neutral with double stand breaks also, there is an increase. So the expression of topo to bit also increased along with the other PARP1 and uh, 270 and uh, the XRCC expression. So all this pro and also see XRCC1 expression. So uh, in summary, uh, so 
uh, you see you can see these are the all the proteins uh, in the aging in the normal aging in the case of uh, the cultured neurons uh, what we observed is over the weeks and uh, the activities of uh, various ber enzymes and uh, the other uh, enzymes and uh, then you so in uh, the so during aging you can see that uh, there is an increase in the uh, dna damage and uh, decrease in nhtj and decrease in tropotropita and uh, what we observed is uh, when we uh, when you have this lit2 and npy we we uh, we down regulated we we observed an increased repair activity that means that this lit2 and npy may be acting as sensitive genes so we have to further study on this so that pankaj singh will be doing the study on sensitive continuing the study on slit2 and npy so that's about uh, the work we have done with uh, in collaboration with uh, professor bora when uh, he asked me to work uh, in the area of brain aging and research so thanks very much for i try to be as uh, quick as possible just to fill in the gap uh, and also just to tempted to share my work uh, to the audience Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kandapi. And first of all, thanks for the organizing. Uh, one question for Professor Kandapi, if, if you have. No, then we go exactly on schedule to one second to uh, Dr. William Bohr, who is a senior investigator uh, in the DNA repair section in the National Institute of Aging, USA. Dr. Bohr received his MD in the 78 and PhD in 1987 and uh, Doctor of Science in 1987 from the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. After training in neurology and infectious diseases at the University Hospital in Copenhagen, uh, Dr. Bohr did a postdoctoral fellowship with Dr. Hans Klino at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. He then worked with Dr. Philip uh, Hanawalt at Stanford University as a research scholar from um, uh, 1982 to 86. In 86, he was appointed to the National Cancer Institute uh, USA as an investigator, becoming a tenured senior investigator in 88. Dr. Bohr developed a research section in DNA repair at the NSI, NCI. Sorry. In uh, 1992, he moved to, to the NIA, to the National Institute on Aging, to become chief of the Laboratory of Molecular Genetics. His main contributions have been in the area of DNA repair. He's worked on many aspects of DNA damage in its processing in the mammalian cells. He developed a widely used method for the analysis of DNA repair in individual genes and found that active genes are preferentially repaired. This observation was a major advance in the declarification of the tight interaction between DNA repair and transcription, a process termed transcription coupled repair. In recent years, numerous papers from his laboratory have focused on mechanisms of DNA damage processing, particularly on nucleotide excision repair and transcription coupling. A main interest now is to elucidate how this uh, process change in relation to aging. And uh, the title of his today's talk will be DNA Repair in Aging and Neurodegeneration. So uh, welcome, Professor Bohr. Uh, you are still muted. Please unmute yourself. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, could you please yeah, yeah. switch to the next slide to see that slides are moving? Yeah. Uh, I have never tried this program before, so I don't Just know. the regular way if, if you can switch. For now, we're still on the first slide. Okay. Now it says stop presenting, but I, I'm i going to try again. I, I, I have never tried this Google uh, Meet thing here, so... I, I'm sorry if I don't know how to do this, but now I'm going to try again, share my screen. Uh, does this show up now? Uh, not yet. Uh, yes, it's beginning to. Okay. And it's, it's stay on the, on the slide by slide presentation. Just uh, try to go to the next slide if it, sh is, if it shows. Yes, is, perfect. Is it full screen now? Uh, yes, and it's, it shows the right slide. Okay. So I, I just wanted to, let me thank you for asking me to participate in this meeting and because of the time difference here in, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Is my screen a uh, full, full size screen? Yes. Okay, so then I just wanna make sure I can point. Uh, can you also see the laser pointer here? Yeah. Okay. 
So again, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I, I'm sorry I couldn't hear most of this meeting because of the time difference here to the United States. But thank you for accommodating this so that I could talk at a time that's a reasonable hour here in the States. Um, I'm, I am very happy to uh, participate in this meeting about Kaluri Super Rao. And I was, uh, have known him for several years and uh, have really enjoyed him as a scientist, a friend, and, and a true gentleman. And uh, this meeting, we, we got to know each other, uh, I would say, 20 years ago or something. And then um, our big effort together was uh, a number of collaborations. And then this workshop that we had uh, 10 years ago in Hyderabad that he and I hosted, supported by the Indo-US Workshop Organization. And this was really, a, a, I gave a talk, uh, and the title of my talk is fairly similar to my talk today. So in general, the topic of my interest has not changed, but uh, it's been greatly inspired by K.S. Rao. And here's a picture from the meeting in 2011. And I had, I, we had a, a really uh, great meeting with several here is Kalori here and Sankamitra, people well known in DNA repair here. And this is George Martin. He's one of the, I would call the most significant people in the developing the aging field here in the United States. And Larry Loeb, who uh, Kalori worked with, Sam Wilson and many others. Uh, came to this meeting and, and we had a real fantastic meeting. It was a lot of effort to get the funding through the Indo-US organization and a lot of reporting and so forth. But we pulled it off and and I have, I, that was my first visit to India in, in 11 and it was a very great experience. And then since then I've had the pleasure to come back two years ago as a guest at the Academy and visit uh, the Indian Institute of Science and, and institutes in, in Delhi on that trip. So I've, I've really been uh, very uh, enjoyed tremendously to visit India and to collaborate with uh, many people there and get to know them. And I've had many Indian postdocs in my lab here in the US. So um, this uh, paper here, I consider a, a very a significant paper, and I'm showing it because of a couple of reasons. Um, and I'll, I'll get into BER a little more, which I, I know you've already discussed. But uh, Kaluri was particularly interested in uh, the, that type of DNA repair. And this paper he did together with Lawrence Loeb, who you saw on the picture, and George Martin, who you saw on the picture, and it was about fidelity of polymerases in neurons from young and very old back in 1985. And at that time, um, the uh, aging field was totally different and just emerging, and this kind of DNA repair and more, should we say, hardcore science at the time was uh, really uh, very novel and uh, a, a great uh, contribution to the field. I think one of his um, early and important papers that showed that he could combine the aspects of DNA repair and, and aging in a very insightful way. Can, can you still hear me? Can anybody hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Can, can you actually see me? Because I don't see anything of myself here on the screen. Can you see me? Yes, we yeah, see yeah. you on the presentation. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry we're asking these questions, but it's novel to me with this program here. So I think you've all discussed this, but um, the aging field is really on a big development. And that's, of course, in part because of this great. Uh, change here from now on we move towards a much stronger population of older people at the cost of younger people and this is of course uh, combined with dramatic increase in healthcare cost and that all of the most important diseases particularly in neuroscience that we're interested in neurology are associated with aging so we have a compilation of really severe factors that need to be dealt with 
because otherwise it's going to cause tremendous problems in the future, which it already has begun to do. And this shows something about the populations around the world. And it is particularly noteworthy that in India, there is a so much younger population than many other places, particularly compared to China here and the United States and Europe. So the demographics in India is quite different. And when I traveled in India, <clears throat> I could still see that people were very interested in getting into aging, but the pressure of finding solutions is less in India, I would think, than in many other parts of the world and gives India tremendous opportunities for the future. So in terms of aging and mechanisms, these hallmarks have gained a great interest in recent years. And these are the features that underlie the aging process. And amongst them, there are some major ones and some minor ones in genomic instability uh, and mitochondrial dysfunction, cell senescence are major aspects that people now agree on are key features underlying aging. And these are the things that we've been interested in in that uh, K.S. Rao was interested in. And then, of course, we have a tremendous onslaught of DNA damage of many kinds that happens all the time where we have a number of known lesions to DNA. And these are oxidative lesions, and these are repaired by base excision repair that Kalori was interested in. But there are many other alterations that I'm shown here, and we have 100,000 DNA lesions per cell per day, uh, roughly, that needs to be repaired unless we, uh, we uh, otherwise we'll see great problems and tons of mutations. And so this just, uh, again, I think uh, illustrates in another way that DNA damage and DNA repair has really gained a lot of interest again here recently because there are many very recent reviews uh, suggesting that the DNA damage is really an underlying feature in aging and disease. And we have, those of us who work with this for a while have always thought so, but now it's becoming very popular and interesting that uh, so many uh, things point towards that DNA damage is a very central feature in um, developing disease and this DNA damage can be repaired or cause a lot of responses. So this slide just emphasizes that consequences of DNA damage are many and many pathways. We have a lot of chromatin rearrangements, immune pathways are gaining a lot of interest correlation of the DNA, transcription changes, replication changes, and these all underlie senescence and aging and neurodegeneration. And then our main focus in the last uh, 15 years has been on another pathway that adds to this picture, whereby there's mitochondrial dysfunction as a consequence, consequence of DNA damage, and this mitochondrial dysfunction leads to mitophagy and bioenergetic deficiencies that I think many people also now think underlie neurodegeneration and aging. So for the signaling of DNA damage, parlation is very important and it's particularly PARP1. It's involved, PARP1 is involved in DNA repair, but also the main parlator, which is formation of these long molecules at sites of DNA damage. And people, you're probably very well for, uh, familiar with these. And the substrate for the process of this elongation is NAD. This occurs in the whole genome, but also in subcompartments. And currently, we don't know so much about where it occurs in these subcompartments, sub but it's a very emerging, interesting field to understand that further. And so when you have a parlation process, one of the main signaling process of DNA damage, you deplete NAD from the cell. And this NAD then uh, causes depletion of function of many other proteins that need NAD as a, as a, as a, as a co-substrate. And one of, them, one of the categories that we've been interested in and many others is sirtuins. Sirtuins regulate many functions in the cell and also including mitochondrial function. 
So Kalori, amongst the many DNA repair processes that we uh, know exist, uh, base excision repair is probably um, less studied than many of the others, but a very profound process because it is essential. And if you knock out some of these uh, pathway proteins in the process, so, uh, mice will die and cells will dysfunction. And basic excision repair involves these steps, glycosylase, AP endonuclease, polymerase, ligase, and ERCC1, and is involved in so many other processes here, including a link directly to the immune system, very important in cancers. And also we've looked at things in cocaine syndrome and found it's important. It's important in many aspects. And uh, our work has focused uh, in recent years on its role in Alzheimer's. And uh, this was, and then also I think the process, uh, its exact role in aging is still not determined, but this is something that K.S. Rao and we and many others have been working on and hopefully making some progress, but it still is not so easy to determine BER processes in vivo and in, in mammalian systems. So there's a tight link between mitochondrial and nuclear signaling, and uh, maybe this is fairly basic, and, but I want to point out that we have a, this NAD metabolism is very important. NAD is an essential molecule in the interplay here between the nucleus and the mitochondria. So our approach has involved to look at these diseases that we call premature aging or progerias, where the individuals that have these diseases uh, get much older, appear much older than they actually are. And uh, these include Werner syndrome, where the patients here look much older um, at a fairly at middle age here, and then cocaine syndrome. And I recently wrote a review of uh, uh, some commentary in the Indian um, Journal of, uh, of uh, neuro uh, Neurology about this because there have been some studies in India on cocaine syndrome, and this is something that I've been very interested in for a long time, this disease. We have others here that are monogenic diseases where the patients appear much older. And all of these are involved that uh, there is a deficiency in DNA repair. So it points out that DNA repair is a central process, and at least in these disease models, uh, very important, probably underlying this age, uh, accelerated age process. And of course, we, we also know from human studies in many settings that DNA repair declines with aging, maybe about 1% per year. So we were particularly interested in some of these who have very severe neurodegeneration. And we looked at these diseases using various approaches. And in particular, we looked at these uh, ataxia Seroderma pigmentosum group A and cocaine syndrome and apotaxin that are associated with very severe neurodegeneration, and many of the others are not. And Werner syndrome is an interesting disease in this context because it is not uh, formally associated with neurodegeneration, but some of the patients have neurodegenerative features, and there are other. Uh, and polymorphisms in the Werner gene are associated with various neurological outcomes. So Werner syndrome is, is in this category, but not as strong as some of the others. And then of course, Alzheimer's disease. And we have used a, a, a lot of models for this, human cells, mouse models, nematodes, and various kinds of approaches to reach the conclusion that all of these conditions are associated with mitochondrial dysfunction. We found increased pyrrolation in all of these conditions, increased ROS in the mitochondria, increased mitochondrial membrane potential, and then decreased mitophagy. And this shows a mitochondria in here with uh, uh, expanded mitophagy degradation. So mitophagy is the process that gets rid of the bad mitochondria. And here's a mitochondria that's pretty damaged. 
and damaged mitochondria are found in these diseases and are found in Alzheimer's uh, very commonly. And then lower NAD at all of these conditions and decreased sirtuin activities and many uh, clinical features of uh, mitochondrial deficiency. So this has led us to work with this model that when we have a decrease in DNA repair, like in these diseases that I mentioned, or also in Alzheimer's disease known for DNA repair problems, then that, and probably in, in aging, we see this DNA damage accumulation in the nucleus in the cell. This leads to a pyrrolation process, as I mentioned, at the sites of DNA damage. This takes away NAD from the cell and lower sirtuin and other protein activities and leads to this mitochondrial dysfunction, which comes in many forms, but we have particularly focused on mitophagy, which is very prominent in these conditions. And this then leads to the neurodegeneration we propose. And then we can intervene in these processes and that's made it attractive that we can uh, increase NAD levels by supplementation with nicotinamide riboside, NMN, and lately we've also increased um, my, uh, uh, mitophagy with another compound, urolithin A, that we have been studying. So the work that we are doing has taken a uh, sort of a translational direction, leading to trying to understand how these NAD supplementations stimulate DNA repair and mitophagy, and we have, uh, it has led to some clinical intervention studies because the findings uh, have been promising. And what we do is supplement with these compounds here that are part of the salvage pathway to add to cellular NAD. And this can be done with these nicotinamide riboside, which uh, people can take up to two grams per day without apparent any, any side effects that we know of. Um, in at least uh, the shorter term, a year or so. And when we do that, we can decrease pyrrolation uh, and ROS formation and membrane potential and then increase mitophagy and improve DNA repair. And I'm going to show you some examples of, of, of this work where we have worked with Alzheimer's. And Alzheimer's is something that I know that, that you're all interested in. And we have, uh, in pointing out underlying features of, of Alzheimer's, of course, these are some of the main things that uh, we and others have been interested in. And um, in terms of DNA repair in Alzheimer's, uh, there's a lot of literature and some lack of clarity, but uh, a lot of DNA repair proteins are dysregulated. By that, I mean that some are upregulated, some are downregulated, most are downregulated. But in a DNA repair process, like in many other metabolic processes, the fine tuning of the process is essential. So if something is upregulated or downregulated, in both cases, it's dysregulated. So I would say that there's a lot of evidence for dysregulation of DNA repair and certainly increased oxidative stress, as in Parkinson's. And we have seen increased nuclear and mitochondrial damage in, um, in the postmortem brains from AD uh, to mild cognitive to, uh, for, to MCI to full AD, I mean, from controls to MCI to AD. Um, I'll skip this here because of time, but just go to that. So our exploration has been for a long time in relation to this base excision repair process that we, we discussed trying to understand if this process is deficient in Alzheimer's and then at what step in the process might this deficiency then be. So we have assays to determine each of these steps, at least in cell extracts. And we did that for postmortem tissue from fresh postmortem post tissue from the Kentucky AD study. And we looked at all the steps in BER, and we found that some of the steps here, APN nuclease and cell extracts from the postmortem brains in the in um, in the um, um, in regions that were affected or not by AD, we saw no change in APN nuclease, but a big change in this polymerase beta, 
that is the protein that is at the step of polymerization. And I'll show you that again. This is the protein that also uh, Kalori Subarao was very interested in working with and has done a number of interesting studies relating to aging. And here we see that in 80 patients, there's a lot lower activity and level of polymerase beta. And this uh, is measured by uh, uh, measuring the, the uh, detecting gap repair in, double, in, in, in a substrate like this. And when you look at that process, it goes down from control to MCI to AD, and it also correlates with the BRAC staging. So we felt that this was a, a, a significant result that led us to uh, suggest that amongst the step in BER here, that it is the gap filling step using Paul Beta that would be the critical step deficient in Alzheimer's. This is also a step that uh, many people call rate limiting um, in the process or critical step. So this led us then to, uh, we also did this in mitochondrial extracts and isolated mitochondria from these uh, postmortem brains and found that although the base excision repair process in mitochondria is slightly different in the mitochondria than in the nucleus, it was also this step of uh, polymerization that was deficient in the mitochondrial extracts. So this led us to develop a mouse model, which took about 10 years to fully develop, which is a mouse model with a 3XTG80 mouse combined with a heterozygote for Paul Beta. And a heterozygote is necessary because you can't have a null because as I mentioned, then they won't survive when they lack a critical BER enzyme, these mice. And so in this mouse model, we published a number of papers with this. We see a number of features that humanizes this mouse towards human AD. And these are some of the things, neuronal cell death uh, and deficient neurogenesis and importantly, loss of synaptic plasticity and loss of olfaction, increased neuroinflammation. So this mouse based on behavior, based on these metabolic studies and based on uh, bioinformatic comparison to humans comes uh, much closer to the human AD situation than the 3XTG AD. And then we did studies with supplementation here where we did this NAD supplementation and we have pretty dramatic effects on inflammation, memory and hearing, and uh, mitophagy. We also done studies looking at um, sex-related differences and looking at regional differences in mitochondrial function in these mouse models. And this interestingly, we here find that, that we see a metabolic shift in females and we proposed, and that was seen in mouse models and, and also in a human study. And we uh, proposed that this could underlie the higher rate of uh, of uh, AD seen in, in females, but much more, of course, it's just a, a, a little part of that. So here's a study that we published a couple of years ago, and it shows that when we um, add NR to the drinking water to the mice, we see an increase in the Paul Beta alone, the AD, 3XTG AD, and AD Paul Beta mice in the brain so that with this treatment, we know that we get increased NAD into the brain. And this is one of the uh, more uh, dramatic findings that we had in this work. We showed here that uh, using this long-term potentiation assay, where you measure um, in electrodes and hippocampus here, uh, the signal was much lower in AD Paul Beta than in wild type, but after NR treatment, uh, we see a complete normalization of the synaptic function using this measure in these NR treated AD Paul Beta mouse model. And this um, also so supported by many other studies that we've done that one of the more dramatic effects of NR is on synaptic transmission related processes and is on neuroinflammation. So in this work, we, we did a lot more to uh, uh, report here. We reported very significant uh, improvements of uh, the behavior 
uh, decreased tau phosphorylation, decreased DNA damage. And, and this work has led to that we're working with others to uh, wards doing NAD intervention in humans. Here we see that uh, we, we see an increase here in H2AX sites in the dentate gyrus and the hippocampus, but after NR treatment, it's much lower. We also looked at individual cells from human AD fibroblast and say measured eight OxoG and the AD is high here, but after treatment, it's significantly lower. So there is an effect of DNA damage. And then we have studied this much more in trying to understand the extent of mitophagy in Alzheimer's and to see if we could also intervene with that. And we did a study um, now two years ago in which we measured uh, mitophagy in different systems, in AD postmortem brain, in iPSC cells, and worms. So we've been using worm models, and and then in mice. And I would emphasize that the worm models for Alzheimer's disease are very useful because AD worms um, actually have a memory deficit that you can measure using chemotactic measurements. And so we use these AD worms to test compounds and also we look for conserved mechanisms, of course. And in, uh, find, in using the worms, we identified that nicotinamide riboside and MN, but also the compound urolithin A had a very strong stimulatory effect on the uh, mitophagy in the worms. And this urolithin A comes from pomegranate here and is uh, also gaining a lot of interest as a uh, stimulator of mitophagy and used in studies, uh, human studies, intervention studies in uh, muscular disease at this time and many others. And using the worms, you can identify the pathways, of course, using genetics. But I'll just mention here that we find that these compounds strongly uh, improved mitophagy in worms and mice, and also in mice. And so it, it's uh, also led to that, you know, support the notion that mitophagy stimulation with different compounds could be very helpful in, uh, in AD. So more lately, uh, just a few slides here because I'm running out of time. Just we have focused on neuroinflammation in these AD models and it's very significant. The neuroinflammation, we use various markers to measure this. And here again with NR intervention, uh, we see dramatic improvements. I think I'm running out of time. So I will just kind of say that we, we also are looking for senescence and senescence is an important marker, of course, of aging in many tissues. And you can measure with beta galactosidase here. And you see that the AD has a AD mouse model here and cortex and hippocampus have significantly more senescence than wild type. But after treatment with NR, we see lower senescence. It is a little similar to using senolytics, although the mechanism is quite different. And we're currently exploring this. Is, is NR an effective um, antagonizer of sen as a senescence? And could NR treatment be combined with senolytics? So um, the, the treatment, I, I think I just mentioned that. So in sort of a conclusion of this and, and a very broad conclusion, I, I still think that there's a lot of documentation to say that DNA damage is a very important factor and maybe damage to other macromolecular pro, uh, macromolecules is a very significant factor in the progression of neurodegeneration and these processes here, vascular factors are affected by DNA damage and DNA repair. Many studies have shown this, at least in, in some models. Glutamate signaling, I didn't have time to discuss that, and mitochondrial dysfunction and neuroinflammation. These are all processes on the way to Alzheimer's and DNA damage may or may not be uh, the very critical instigative factor, but at least 
we can suggest that DNA uh, repair is a protective factor against um, AD and that uh, maybe it, it's one of those processes that by improving it could uh, delay the process of Alzheimer's or improve it. So with this, I would like to just mention that the work was done by these individuals here, uh, in particular, Deb Coteau, and Evander Fang did a lot of the work. He's now a professor in Oslo, Norway. And Eugen Howe is, is now a professor in Shanghai. And many of these other people have contributed significantly to this work. We've worked with the Danish Center for Healthy Aging, our colleagues in Copenhagen. We've worked with colleagues in NIA and with this group in Greece who contributed significantly to uh, the work with the nematodes. And we've worked with a Japanese group in, in intervention. And with that, I think I'll just finish here and be happy to take any questions. <clears throat> yes, please, questions to Professor Bohr. Questions, anybody? Well, uh, if there are no questions, uh, I want to thank you, uh, Professor Bohr, and uh, I want to conclude this part by thanking Ah, no, uh, there is uh, baby Kumari, please go ahead. Sir, I go want ahead. to ask, like, uh, first of all, I'll uh, thank you to give for giving this uh, informative talk. I like uh, to ask, like, what the genes which you have found common between both this Alzheimer's disease and between the aging process. Are there any genes which are common to Parkinson's also? Have you done that uh, experiment or in? So we have not worked on, you know, total sequencing kinds of processes to understand the underlying genes. And of course, uh, they, there are many uh, diverse findings in this, but in terms of genes that play a role, and you might be thinking about DNA repair, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it's, it's very clear that in, and I, I was focusing here on Alzheimer's and trying to give some uh, indication of what DNA repair genes or functions could play a role in this. And in Parkinson's, <clears throat> there's also a very high accumulation of oxidative damage and also defects in the repair process, but I have less insight into that than an AD. And uh, so in some ways, there might be more strong, this, the accumulation of oxidative damage in Parkinson's is even more significant than in Alzheimer's. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yes, Karishma. Uh, yes, Karishma sir. So, yes, sir. So thank you for the presentation. Um, since you have emphasized on this DNA repair mechanism as being protective role for this Alzheimer's, I just wanted to ask you, like, what are all the intervention you think would be feasible to enhance this DNA repair mechanism in order to stop this AD progression? Yeah, so it, <laughs> it's an excellent question. Thank you. And the, the process of DNA repair is very complicated. And so upregulation of one particular DNA repair gene or something might not improve the condition, but worsen the condition. Because as I mentioned, if there is a, um, the, the system needs to be in, 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 in harmony before you can get this, this to work better. So, Things like, like NAD uh, stimulation does stimulate more than one particular DNA repair process. But you would like to look at things in the future where we could stimulate the whole process of BER with one kind of, of, of drug, say. And there might be um, post-translational modifications like um, Th things have been found where you have uh, one uh, post-translational process that is common to a whole pathway. That is maybe the case in BR. So if you could, in, in one process, upregulate 
all the genes involved in the pathway, all the steps involved in the pathway, then that could maybe achieve that the whole pathways was significantly upregulated. And people are looking at that kind of uh, idea at current time. Thank you. So all right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I had a small question, sir. Please, Anand. Yeah. Uh, Rama, you're asking some questions. So, yeah. Uh, Go on. Go I just on. wanted to know uh, if algebras or Parkinson's, some of these diseases may be also due to proteostasis. Am I right? Uh, BB, I'm sorry, I couldn't understand that. B what? Algebra. His voice is gone. So, but anyway, the NAD stimulants that you, you've been used for the, the mice model, uh, how much is the localized in the brain? So it's not mainly localized in the brain. It is mainly um, in, in other tissues. But the question was, when, when we started this, and the question still remains, does it get through the blood-brain barrier? Yeah, and yeah. we don't know there's been a lot of dispute about that actually and so we're using radioactive tracers it's a uh, there are many kinds of results we see a lot in the kidney for example in certain organs but we our study does not necessarily have to uh, uh, suggest that nr itself goes through the brain barrier but something of a metabolite goes through that raises the the, the brain NAD. And this has also just been done in some patients with Parkinson, where they did used NR and also found with slightly different technology that NAD increases in the brain. Okay. Professor Ramaya, please. Thank you. Yeah, I have this question now. I know you are working on the DNA damage repair to connecting Alzheimer's and the importance of NAD, urolithin, and NMN. They're found to be good, actually. They're going to increase the reducing potential of the cells of the things. But recently, proteostasis is also impaired in these uh, diseases. Am I right? Yeah, I would think so. Uh, there is a drug which has come out, ISRIP. Have you heard of it? Uh, which one? ISRIP, Integrated Stress Response Inhibitor, which is discovered by Peter Walter. Which it's is not okay. It's not been. Uh, uh, it's not an approved drug or anything. Is it a natural it's substance? It's not approved, but it is under clinical trials. I heard. Yeah. Are you able? Are you are you aware of it? Just I wanted to know the mechanism of action of that ISRIP on mitochondria, actually. Yeah, I, I think I know which drug you're talking about, and I have. This increases uh, actually memory. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 <clears throat> I have. Um, I'm, a, I'm a bit skeptical and have very little knowledge about it, so I, I don't know. Okay. Right. Oh, okay. One last question from Nea, and we conclude. Nea, please. Uh, hello, sir. Yes. Sir, in case of progeria, what we have seen that there is a difference in the physiological age versus the mental age. So, like, uh, how can we say that there are difference? Like, uh, uh, not exactly we can say or uh, we can predict that there are any changes in the brain aging and the physiological aging and how are the, or the how there might be some changes in the uh, DNA repair processes like uh, in physiological as well as the uh, like mental aging. Yeah, so um, that's a very good and very broad question and in, in progeria is uh are you studying progeria is that the one you're studying so no sir i am studying senescence okay <laughs> Norm, uh, uh, in vitro senescence so i think it's very different for the different progerias what are what is in common is that this this look of uh, accelerated aging and in some cases like cocaines and progeria you see it in very small children very early in other cases, like Werner syndrome, it doesn't start till about 15, 16 years and then increases rapidly. 
So how do we know about the brain aging? I guess that in some cases we have uh, mental problems. In other cases, not so many mental problems. So we would maybe not know so much about the brain aging in those cases. That would be things like Werner syndrome, whereas uh, in Cockin syndrome, there's a very dramatic neurodegeneration. And I think the, the other thing, so in some of the diseases, like in Werner syndrome, it's quite dramatic that the patients get um, so many of the features seen in normal aging, but just much earlier. Uh, it's, yes. it's very well characterized in Werner syndrome when you look at the progression of disease symptoms that they, you see the graying of a hair 30 years before you see it in normal individuals and things like that. Uh, so some of the models are associated with real many features of aging, and then many of them and all of them are associated with some aspect of DNA repair deficiency. The classic ones are seroderma pigmentosum. That was uh, the earliest uh, sort of progeric DNA repair disease that was well studied, and here the patients get a tremendous amount of cancers, which may be the cause of uh, the lack of DNA repair. So not so much neurodegeneration, but cancer in those cases. But so we can't really, um, you know, uh, how do you know how old a person is? So there is a, uh, a biological aging, there is a, uh, many kinds of aging. But now, for example, we can mark it also with uh, markers of uh, chromatin structure kinds of things and um, and so but anyhow I'm getting a little carried out okay uh, off subject here but it's a good question but probably depends on the particular progeria thank you okay. thank you very thank much, you so much for your input well thank you so much for having me yes and uh, I would uh, be uh, happy to conclude uh, this uh, section this part uh, by thanking once again every participant, all the speakers, uh, Professor Anand Kondapi, first of all, for organizing this amazing event. I myself am extremely honored and excited to be a part of it, to honor Professor Karuli Subarao's legacy in supporting aging research and promoting aging research, educating about it. Hopefully, uh, this meeting will contribute uh, to the continuation of this legacy, and uh, this legacy and this tradition will continue. Uh, once again, uh, thank you, and... Uh, I believe with the last uh, vote of thanks goes to Professor Kondapi and uh, Dr. Uh, Pankaj Singh. So thanks again. Thank you for organizing this. And it's a pleasure to contribute to Kalawari, Kalawari's, uh, the memory of Kalawari Rao. So your, your mic is on mute. Thanks to all speakers who readily agreed and uh, they came into the uh, all the, the time and then uh, were present, some of them from starting. And especially thanks to Dr. Stamler, who really spent all the time and also coordinated this event very well. And uh, Professor Bo, Bo for uh, joining uh, today uh, and then sharing his, his work and uh, all other speakers. Uh, uh, like uh, Kariyas Jis and uh, Stodling, Kundaya, and uh, uh, Tapur, and uh, the Professor Ramaya, Swain, uh, all others, and uh, thanks a lot. Uh, formerly, Pankaj Singh, so any concluding remarks you want to give that, that stand up? Um, any concluding? Uh, my, I just said my final remarks. I'm just uh, happy and... Uh, and excited that the, the, this legacy continues. So th th I have no more to, to say. I want to, to speak more on, on such events in the future. That's all I have to say. Okay, okay thanks a lot. So Pankaj, you formally give the thanks. Oh, okay. Pankaj thanks. is uh, the, one of the young uh, faculty member who is now taking up repair, DNA repair work, uh, research at Senescence and DNA repair work in uh, our department. Thank you. So, yes. so uh, with all the great lectures delivered as a part of this uh, uh, symposium, so let me take this opportunity to thank all the people who are behind this event. 
So let me start with the thanking Professor Prakash Babu and Professor Kondapi to organize this meeting, uh, which is specifically themed on aging and mechanism and intervention. Uh, we have Professor Stambler here, who is scientist and a science activist, uh, work for promoting healthy aging. And uh, the question is like why we should promote aging is now I think it is clear and, uh, you know, because aging is not only about the neurological aging or neurodegenerative disorders, it also affect, uh, you know, the other diseases also. And that we have recently seen like in the COVID infection where the, you know, the older people are uh, you know more prone to the infection and the mortality rate was high. And uh, this was also reflected in our, uh, you know, particularly in India in the vaccination program, which was implemented by government that, the first people to be vaccinated were the you know, 60 plus, then 45 plus, and then 18 plus, and now still the kids uh, you know yet to be vaccinated. So the aging has you know it's uh, not only for the neurological perspective, but for with respect to all the disease, and that's why we think that you know there is an uh, uh, there should be an increase uh, or uh, the, the promotion of the aging research should be there in the scientific community. And this work, uh, you know, the professor, uh, uh, late Professor Subara, which the work he has done is, you know, really boosted up a significant, uh, you know, contribution in the terms of the aging when we talk about India. So uh, let me thank Professor Stamler and Professor Mahindra Thakur for chairing this session and uh, for a smooth coordination of the talks uh, during this session. I also thank all the professor, uh, all the speakers who agreed uh, with the short notice uh, to give presentation and sharing the knowledge with us. And uh, <clears throat> also I would like to thank the participants uh, for joining this symposium and making this a successful event. And at last, uh, I also uh, would like to thank the uh, committee members of the you know, coordinating committee and volunteering students, and also the staffs for helping us to organize this event. So uh, if uh, anyone is left, I would like to thank anyone. I don't want to name each and everyone, but let us have, uh, it was a nice session and very fruitful. And a lot of, you know, we have seen from the, uh, you know, the recent updates as well as the past research which have been done uh, you know, in, the, in this particular uh, field. So thank you all. So I'll close this session and thanks once again for coming and joining with us. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.